IB Nation. Welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It is Monday. It is March 4th. Notre Dame is going to kick off their spring practices this weekend, this week. They're going to have one practice this week before they go on spring break, and then they'll come back for a lot more here in the middle of March. But we will get to see this team in action a little bit here over the next this next week. And I am uh, started kind of a little bit yesterday. I'm going to have a lot more coming out tonight all week and have a ton of spring previews. I'm going to have all the position previews out by uh, by when, by Thursday when they start practicing and have some spring questions, breakout articles. I'm going to have a lot of, just so you understand where we're at before we dive into today's mailbag, I'm going to have obviously the position previews, but because there's going to be over 10 days between practice one and practice two, I'm going to have a lot of sort of like the the breakout articles and the sort of the the smaller art, you know, smaller focus articles as opposed to the big questions and position previews will come out before spring starts. And then we'll dive into those other questions later as we get things rocking and rolling. So that's what is on the agenda for this week. We'll obviously have a, a lot of those things we'll discuss during the shows over the next couple of weeks. We'll do the same thing with the shows. We'll have some, you know, some bigger picture, picture questions that we'll discuss here over the next couple, couple days that uh, on the shows today, obviously being a day where we're going to focus on mailbag. But we'll have a lot of that stuff coming up here soon. But then we'll dive into even some of the, the more nitty gritty aspects of the team and, and spring practice and all that kind of stuff as we get closer. As we excuse me, as we get uh, into in between that practice one and practice two period, which is going to actually be, like I said, a ten plus day period. So just giving you all a heads up on where we are with what is going on in regard to the latest and. There's some recruiting questions in here as we'll, we'll get into, and I'll, I'll kick off with one of them at the beginning just to kind of point some of you back to the message board. The best place to get the latest intel on the message board is going to be uh, on recruiting from Irish Breakdown is going to be in the message board. You know, I'm, I'm not going to give a ton of updates on those things in this format. This is There's just obvious reasons why that is, but the best place to get that is on the message board. We did have a question from Ronnie Reeves, and we'll just go ahead and kick things off of there. Has there been f- further development with Damian Shanklin? Is there another recruit that is comparable to him? If he decides to go elsewhere, Ronnie, I discussed that on the message board. I'm going to leave that there for now. Uh, we may address that down the road, but those are the type of things that we put out uh, on the message board. And I did talk about that because that's a very interesting recruitment. And there have been some developments that I discuss in that uh, in, in that discussion. So that's going to be the place for that. But I'm ready to really kind of launch into the to the mailbag. You guys have about 20 questions out right now that we'll get to and we're just going to rock and roll. So we're going to answer, I'm going to answer questions until a, you guys run out of them or B I can't talk anymore. So I I am ready to rock and roll and get this thing going. We're going to start things off with a much appreciated super chat down here. Where is the super chat? I just saw it and now it is gone. Let me go find it real quick. Oh, here we go from Tyler Evans. Tyler says, give me three players that help themselves after Indianapolis who is getting first round buzz. Uh, Tyler, I would love to be able to answer that question for you, but I can't, I mean, I, I'll tell you who is going to get buzz. I don't know if it's going to actually have any insight. It's just pick the guys that run fast. I mean, Jarrell Worthy is going to get, or Jarrell Worthy, goodness gracious, that's the D tackle for Michigan State. Uh, Xavier Worthy is a guy that people are going to be talking a lot about being a first round pick now because he ran a 4-2-1. Personally, it doesn't change my opinion of him one bit. If, in fact, in my opinion, it 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 hurts him in my view, and and look, John Ross ran a four two two. There's no difference between a four two two and a four two one. John Ross was a much better college player than Xavier Worthy, and John Ross wasn't a very good NFL player at all. And there's always different reasons for it. But you know, a guy that ran a four two one, I just think should be a more dominant player. Oh, he has some nice numbers and all that, but I just have never been very high on Xavier Worthy. He's a pure speed guy. He's a guy that his play strength is very average. And that's probably being kind, inconsistent hands. He's small. Uh, I, I wouldn't take, a, take him in the first round. And I, and I know people obsess over the 4 2 1, but if you go look at some of the, the fastest 40 times, not very many of those guys were actually good football players outside of what? Chris Johnson, off the top of my head, you know, of the 4 2 guys. I can't remember a whole lot of others that really have done a whole lot. Like, what did, you know, Dre Archer do in the NFL? You know, guys like that. So, I just don't put as much into that, but he's a guy, for example, that's going to get a lot of buzz just because of the 40 time. But honestly, I most of the buzz coming out of the combine is just media people. It's like that every year. They're going to, who had the biggest combine, who's going to jump, who's going to do that. You know, I can focus on what I think the Notre Dame guys did and I'll share that. We have some questions about that here in a little bit, but 
you know, I, I, a guy that for me, just my opinion, I could tell tell you something is is Roma Dunze. If you're having any conversations about where certain players rank in the draft, Roma Dunze is a guy for me that that helped himself this weekend because I'll just be honest with you, this is just this is my personal preference. I like competitors. And to me, Romo Dunze is a guy that's getting a lot of top 10 to 15 NFL draft pick projections. The rest of his draft class, the rest of those guys are either not working out or in the case of like some of these guys, they're not even willing to go out there and and be tested, which I thought was kind of weird. But two guys went out this week to me that are first round picks that 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 impressed me. Roma Dunze is one. He ran a 4-4-5. Four, four, Good sized guy, 6'3", 212, ran a 4-4-5. Four, four, 39 inch vertical, 688 cone drill, which is which is really good change of or change of direction ability. 403 shuttle, really good change of direction ability for a bigger guy. But he competed. I mean, he he, he did the testing. He also went through drills. He did all that kind of stuff. I think Brian Thomas is a guy coming out that uh, I think for, for me helped himself. Uh, he's another big guy that ran really fast and moved really well. Had the second best 40 time of all the receivers with a 433. Did that at 6'3", 209. Uh, also showed very good explosive numbers, 38.5-inch vertical, 10'6 broad, which are good. They're not great, but they're good. He's just such a super raw guy that I mean, his game needs a ton of work, but he's another guy that just if you're willing to coach him up, you get him in the first round. You take. I, I would much rather take a chance on on guys like Ramon, Roma Dunze and – and Brian Thomas and Jane McMillan and Keon Coleman and guys like that, then I it, then I would a guy like Z, uh, Xavier Worthy who runs fast, put up good numbers, but is not to me a, a guy that projects well to the next level. That that's my two cents on that one. But again, that's just I tend to focus on receivers for obvious reasons. But as far as who uh, uh, nationally help themselves the most, I I'm not the person to ask that one. Um, we'll I'll have Ryan on at some point in time this week, so we'll try to get him to be able to answer that one. Next up, we're going to go from Broke Neck Boy. How would you, how would the best Notre Dame team you've seen stack up against the best teams all time and the chances of them winning? Well, I, I can't tell you all time. I can tell you with all time of when I've been watching football. I, the two, the best Notre Dame teams I've seen, ironically, are two teams that didn't win a title. And that's 89 and 92 are probably the two best Notre Dame teams I've seen. The 89 teams, probably the best combination of talent results the 92 team was so frustrating with the fact that they weren't able to finish but the 89 team was outstanding as far as how they stack up it's so impossible to do that because how can I possibly take a team that was running a certain offense I mean they're running a 5-2 defense in 1989 it was worked perfectly for 1989 but you can't run that defense in 2019 against LSU it's a completely different game so you know it's impossible to, to to me to compare decades. What I would say is, is that that team was as dominant as any team outside of obviously 89 Miami, 95 Nebraska was more dominant, 2001 Miami, 2000 and probably say 2004 USC was more dominant than that team. I'd go let's see 2012 Bama is in that conversation, 2018 Clemson and 2019 LSU. Uh, as far as just dominance of their era. I think that's the best way to to to, to for me to evaluate it is is stacking up dominance of that era. Like, you know, how, how does the 95 Nebraska team stack up as far as their dominance against 2001 Miami or 2019 LSU? Because you just – the errors are so much different now than then. I mean, blocking rules are different. There are so many things that LSU would have a hard time preparing for things that Nebraska did. Nebraska would have a hard time preparing for things for LSU. Did. It's just a different game. And and so I I kind of look at it that way, and that's why that's what makes 2019 LSU so good to me is because you, you just the, the level of dominance they had, but also their willingness to be to win tough games, and that's something that matters a lot to me. Is it's one thing to go out and just whoop people, but you know how how do you handle the moments where you don't bring your A game? I think of Texas in 2019. I think of 
you know, I think of um, uh, the Auburn game that year where they definitely didn't have their A game, but they were able to do what they needed to do to win. USMA with a question. Top three winners and losers from the combine, Notre Dame and non-Notre Dame. I'm not going to give you the non-Notre Dame ones because, honestly, I don't pay enough attention to that stuff uh, to have an opinion of that. Uh, outside of the receivers, always always watch receivers. But top three winners and losers from the combine. I don't – I won't say well, – I, I don't say losers, but the guys that, that didn't help themselves – at Notre Dame. So I'll get into that guys that I thought helped themselves at, at Notre Dame this week. I don't, I'll say Joe Walt. I don't want to say helped himself because I don't know if he necessarily rose up draft boards. I think he's pretty high, but I, I think it just comes down to cementing himself. When you look at the production he had, I was having an argument with a friend of mine today and he, he was trying to tell me that, you know, Joe Walt's 40 time wasn't good enough or whatever. And I just, I was like, dude, come on, man. Like, first of all, who cares? Number one. Number two, his 10 yard split was, I think, tied for fifth amongst all tackles at six, eight and a half, 321. His three cone drill, I think Ryan had this yesterday, and it was something like it was like the eighth or ninth best since two, 1999, something like that. That NFL teams, to me, should care a whole lot more about that than they do a 40 time. His, I thought he, he cemented himself to me as the, as the best tackle in this class. I think he, he certainly helped himself. Uh, at the combine some other guys that, that helped themselves uh this week i would uh i'd say cam hart tested very well i think javante jean baptiste tested very well i think blake fisher did some things well some things not very well i think his combine perform i've seen i've seen all types of reactions to that some people really praised it some people didn't i just thought it was kind of typical blake fisher some things he did very well and some things he did not do very well which is kind of blake's career at notre dame the thing that impressed me about blake that I think helped him more than anything is his arms measured it. It's over 34 inches long and he had an over 82 inch wingspan. I never thought Blake was super long uh, at Notre Dame. He just doesn't come across that way, but that's very good length. That's like clear tackle length out there. So I still think his game is probably better suited to guard, but that's something I think helped him out quite a bit in that regard. Guys that didn't help themselves, you know, JD Bertrand not being able to run, it's not going to help his cause. You know, he had he was walking around with a boot. Don't know what happened. He did well on the bench, but um, you know, I think that's something that that's going to hurt him. I forgot to say this about Joe Walt too. Is Joe Walt right now? I love competitors, and Joe Walt is a guy that went out there at the combine and literally did every test. He ran the forty. He ran the shuttle. He ran the three cone. He did the broad. He did the vertical, and he benched. He did twenty seven reps on the bench, which is with over thirty four inch arms is really good. So to see a guy that's considered a top five to 10 pick, it'd be the same as like Malik neighbors doing everything at the combine. You know, that guy that's battling for that number one or number two spot in his draft class, top 10 pick going out there and doing everything. Joe did that. And that, that, that matters to me. I, I, I like guys that like to compete. I like guys that aren't afraid of I mean, certain guys saying, Hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna let you measure us. It's just some of this stuff is just getting stupid. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's just getting stupid, but it is what it is. And that's, that's the direction that everything's going. So I just, I thought Joe helped himself, you know, Maris didn't get to do anything. You know, I, I don't know that he hurt himself, but he certainly didn't help himself from a workout standpoint. But the other part of this too, is that's big for the combine. And that's why I'm hesitant to say too much about guys helping hurt themselves because it, the combine's not just about the testing, you know, they're going through medicals, but there's a lot of meeting going on with people. And and I remember being told a few years ago that um, a, a former Notre Dame coach had to go up to a Notre Dame player, like right in the middle of the combine and say, Hey man, you need to get your, you know what together because I'm talking to NFL teams and, and you're, I don't know what you're saying in your, your meetings, but they are coming away and you are rubbing everybody the wrong way. You know, you're going to get some of that. You're going to get some guys that like, Hey, I'm kind of torn between these two kids. And then you sit down and have the one-on-one -on -one and you're like, okay, this is the kind of person that we need to add. Whereas this guy may also be a great person. It may not make a difference, but this guy's man, just this guy's going to work. He's got the right attitude. He comes from the right background. This guy over here, entitled, doesn't want to work, thinks he's old stuff. It, you know, the things like that can can be separators, in my opinion. It's like that in recruiting. You know, you got two guys of equal talent, equal production. Then what do you do to separate them? Sometimes it's size. Okay, equal talent, equal production. One guy's 6'4", 210. The other guy's 5'11", 175. That's a separator. You know, one guy has... 
you know, a, a character issue or a work ethic issue, or, you know, you've heard things about this, or there's that problem and this other guy, everything else is equal. This other guy, great worker, great leader, you know, comes from a great program where you, where you know, those kids work, those are separators. And sometimes those things can have uh, an impact as well. And a guy, I may say, Hey, this guy didn't help himself at the combine. Cause I'm just focusing on the testing numbers. But in reality, you know, this kid got on the board and, and was, you know, let, let's take JD Bertrand. Okay. So I'm saying, Hey, he didn't help himself, but I don't know what was going on behind the scenes with JD. I don't know that he, he might've sat down and, and got on the board with some defensive coordinator, head coach, who's a defensive guy and draw this up and draw that up. And JD's just, you know, whiz kid up there on the board and that helps him. I, I don't know those things. So I'm hesitant to say too much, but just from a testing standpoint, those are the guys that I think had, had the, the impact this week. I have a super chat for my den Banami. If there is a 14 team team that hurts Notre Dame pretty bad. No, I, I look, I, no, it doesn't. I mean, guys, listen, if Notre Dame is a top 10 team, they're not going to be left out of the playoff. First of all, thanks for the super chat. I did. I know that every time some of these things happen, you guys look for how it hurts Notre Dame. But at the end of the day, what is this playoff format about? It's about money. That's all they care about. Notre Dame makes money. They're not going to purposely try to screw Notre Dame out of, of, of uh, in a season. Now, they may try to do things to kind of force Notre Dame to join a conference out of season. That's a different conversation. But there's going to be at least three at-large bids. A lot of the automatic qualifiers are going to be teams that would, were ranked kind of high anyway. There's no, I just don't see any scenario, and there's no evidence of this scenario where the committee is going to be unfavorable to Notre Dame. Point me to the year from 2014 to 2023 where you felt Notre Dame was unfairly treated by the playoff committee. I don't think there was one, in my opinion. And in some years, I actually felt Notre Dame got too much love. 2021 being an example where they finished like sixth, fifth, or actually fifth ahead of Oklahoma State, I believe. Uh, in, in the playoff rankings when they didn't have a, a win over a ranked team all year. So Notre Dame makes money. If they're a top 10 team, I don't see a scenario in which they're left out of the out of the college football playoff. I just don't. Because you'd have to say, okay, if we're talking about automatic qualifiers for the ACC and SEC. So let's say it's a 14-team playoff. They give four, four, two, and two. That's 10 plus an, a group of five automatic. That's 11. So there's three extra spots. Who are the teams that are getting those automatic bids from, from the Big Ten and the SEC? It's teams ranked high. There's no way the fifth best Big Ten team, the fifth best SEC team, and at least one of the third best Big 12 or ACC teams are going to be ranked higher than Notre Dame, are going to get in over a top 10 Notre Dame team. It's just not going to happen. So because Notre Dame is going to make them money, but it also practically they, those teams are all going to be ranked lower than Notre Dame. So I think the 14 team playoff is stupid. I don't think there's any point in going to there. It's a money maker. It's not about the kids. It's not about, it's not about, you know, the game. It's about nothing other than money. And if these teams were smart, they'd say, Hey, look, there's going to be years. We may get five teams in. So you're actually limiting yourself, but they're looking for the guaranteed money. That's what it's about. But Notre Dame is not going to be left in the cold guys. It just, if you just stop and think about it for a second, I'll ask you this, the, the folks that are freaking out about Notre Dame being left out and all this other kind of stuff. First of all, stop listening to the national media because that's where a lot of your negativity comes from, number one. Number two, ask yourself this. There's three available spots. What are the odds that the fifth-ranked SEC, fifth-ranked Big Ten, third-ranked Big 12, third-ranked ACC, what are the odds that all four of those are ranked higher are, are going to get in, are going to be ranked higher than a top 10 Notre Dame team. It's just not practical. It's not going to happen. So if there's three at large bids because of all the atom automatic qualifiers, if Notre Dame's a top 10 team, they're still getting in. And if they're not a top 10 team, they don't deserve to be in, to be honest with you, or I don't care about them getting in because they're not a championship caliber team, barring some unforeseen circumstance where, you know, your starting quarterback missed the first six games of the year. You lost a couple games, and then you went out. There's just way too much paranoia, and it's it's that I don't know what it is from ND fans, but look, the committee is going to treat Notre Dame right because Notre Dame makes them money, 
And just practically speaking, even if you don't believe that, practically practically speaking, there's almost zero chance. Somebody can do the research, find me a year in the last in the playoff era, or go back 15 years, put the teams into the conferences they'd be in now, find me a year where the fifth best ACC or the fifth best Big Ten, fifth best SEC, third best Big 12, and third best ACC, or fourth of those, or sixth of those, right? Where that at least those teams all would rank higher than a Notre Dame team that's in the top ten. Find me a year that that would have happened, because that's the only way Notre Dame gets left out. Is if all the non-automatic qualifying teams are ranked higher than them. Because again, you can have a fifth a Big Ten, a fifth SEC team rank higher than them, and still Notre Dame would get in because they're the third automatic qualifier. It would have to be. Three of those four, actually, yeah. Three of those four would have to be ranked higher than Notre Dame. It's just not going to happen. So if Notre Dame's good enough to get in, if they're a top-10 team, they'll get in. It's as simple as that. Thank you for the Super Chat, by the way. Iden Benami also asks, thank you, Iden, is it realistic to think Mitchell Evans could could uh, comes back before games five and six? Yeah, it's possible. I mean – he got hurt. I mean, it's possible he doesn't miss any games. It just depends on the severity of his injury. ACLs now tend to be about six to eight month injuries, depending on the severity. And so he got hurt in November. So you're talking about six months being sometime between May to July when he's back. Now, after that, there's the rehab and there's the building the strength and things like that. So if it's on the eight month end, that could because it was, was it mid it was mid no he got hurt against Pitt, so it would have been early November. It would have been the first Saturday of November, so December, January, February, March, April, May six months, June, July is eight months. So if he's on the longer end of the six to eight month rehab, and the surgery wouldn't have happened until like you know at least a week later uh, because they have to let swelling go down and all that, but. If he's on the late end of it, he's back working out in July, August at the latest, which is enough time if you don't get if you can't get him ready for the opener, at least the first couple of games. So I don't think Mitchell's going to miss a ton of time, if any. So I would I would say it's very realistic that he gets back before games five and six, barring any setback or some severity of the injury being greater than what my understanding the severity of the injury is at this point in time. I had a question from Joe Allen. Thank you, Joe. If one of the quarterbacks jumps into the portal, does Notre Dame look for one in the portal for the 2025 years? Or do you think there is a dude already on the roster? So, Joe, I'm going to assume you meant 2024, because if we're talking about 2025, there's no need to go to the portal for 2025. You just get a, another high school kid. Uh, but also, you also have to think about the fact that Anthony Rezac is being brought in. I think if... I'll answer both ways. If you're talking about 2024, if one of the kids goes in the portal, you'll have Riley Leonard and and two of Steve Angeli, CJ Carr, Kenny Minchie. Plus you'll have Dylan Devison. Plus you'll have Anthony Rezac. So I think you'll still be good there for 2024. If you look at 2025, you know, let's say that as long as you don't have anyone else transfer out, you'll still have the two that we talked about. You'll let's just say it's I don't even want to say, I don't even want to speculate, but you have two of the three of Angeli, Carr, and Minchie. Plus you'll have Deuce Knight. Plus you'll still have Reven, uh, uh, Dylan um, Devison and, and Anthony Rezac. So there's a chance they could go to the portal if one of those guys doesn't establish himself. But I, I think they're in a position now where as long as they don't have multiple transfer out transfers out, then you're, you're in a situation where you don't need to go to the portal for depth next year. And if anything, I could think Notre Dame could just go to Deuce Knight and say, hey, listen, man, you know, you're still our guy, but you know we need to restock the depth chart a little bit. We're going to bring in this kid who's a you know, program kid who, who'd be better than a preferred walk-on, but a kid that you've kind of got to offer a scholarship to get. I'd see something like that and and more than, than going back to the portal. But it also depends on who's out there, right? I mean, you know, Notre Dame, there could be a, a kid that's a – you know, an Ivy League kid or a Patriot League kid that's a quality player that that knows he's not an NFL quarterback that could help you out from a depth standpoint. If there's a kid like that, certainly, certainly can see that. Like there's a running back they're bringing in who played it. I think Colgate, I think is where he's from the last few years. 
uh, you know, had over a thousand career yards rushing. I mean, not going to probably help Notre Dame much, but but good depth guy to have. There could be guys like that as well because depth isn't just about okay, do we have enough guys to get out of a game? I mean, if you got three, the odds of you needing to go past three quarterbacks in a season is very slim. It happens every now and then, but it's very slim. It's it's about having a, at least a one-two depth chart that can play, but then also who's running your scout team? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? And that's where depth is also needed for a team. You, you, you're not going in the season saying, we might have to play our fourth quarterback. If that happens, that's devastating. And I don't care who you have, you're, you're that's going to be a problem in my opinion. God Country Notre Dame with a question says, what are some storyline position battles, storylines, position battles, et cetera, we should really focus on during the spring? What are you anticipating as far as the offense against defense by spring? Will they be pretty even or is there more of a fall thing to hope for? I'll say this. If the offense is ahead of the spring, (laughs) ahead of the spring, if the offense is ahead of the defense by the end of spring, one of two things is going to be true. One, the offense is going to be freaking awesome in 2024, or the defense is going to take a step back. Maybe a combination of those two things. Spring to me is still a time where more often than not, the defense is going to be ahead of the offense, especially in a situation like this where Everybody, you're you're losing some very important players in their defense. I mean, you're losing Cam Hart. You're losing DJ Brown. You're losing J.D. Bertrand. You're losing Maris Leofau. You're losing Javante Jean-Baptiste. You don't have Gabriel Rubio. You lost Thomas Harper. You lost some important players, but you've got a lot coming back that have also played a lot of football. And even the guys that didn't play a lot of football are still playing in the same defense where everyone on offense is starting over, basically. You know, Mike Denbrock will most likely try to keep the terminology similar, but it's a very different offense that you're bringing in. There's going to be, in my opinion, a much bigger change going from Reese to Parker, or excuse me, much bigger change going from Parker to to Denbrock than there was going from Reese to Parker. And in some ways, that's going to help certain players in position battles. You know, so you look at quarterback, for example. You know, how much does the experience Steve Angeli had and had in the offense help him compared to Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr. Well, it depends on how much of the offense is still going to be there going into next season. And you can put that across the board. But there's going to be so many new players learning a new offense. I mean, everybody on offense is learning a new offense to some degree. And and so I think that also factors into why the defense should be ahead. Now, to the first part of your question, which is about some storylines and position battles. Storylines, I mean, it, it's I'm going to have a couple articles coming out about this today and tomorrow. When you look at the offense, you know, how quickly will they adapt to Mike Denbrock's offense? Who, who you know, this is a storyline uh, as well. How does the offensive line shake out? Not so much from a position battle standpoint, which is part of it, but more so how do they play? Do they step up? What is the receiver rotation going to look like? You know, how are they going to how are they going to step up and, and re- be able to replace Joe Walt, Blake Fisher, Roderick Estime? Those are big question marks. Who steps up from a leadership standpoint? Like it is very easy for us to point to defensive players that could be captains this year. I mean, you think of Howard Cross, Xavier Watts, Benjamin Morrison, Jack Kaiser, Riley Mills. You, you, you could go through a lot of different guys. And, and Jordan Clark, I think, was a captain at Arizona State. He, you know, He's coming over. Offensively, you're like, well, okay, maybe Pat Coogan, Riley Leonard, you know, you, you want your quarterback to be captain. You know, may, maybe Mitchell Evans, maybe Jaden. I mean, it, it's not so – it's not as obvious – on offense. So one of the big storylines is who who are going to be the players that step into that that void and then make it obvious by the end of spring. You know, does a Jaden Thomas say, hey, look, it's my time now. I don't I don't care if I'm playing 25 snaps a game or 40, 50 snaps a game. I've got to be a leader over here. Kind of like how Nana was last year for the defense. I mean, he was one of the most underrated players on Notre Dame's team last year, not just because he was a solid backup, but Nana gave great leadership last year. You know, does Jaden step into that role? Does Mitchell Levins kind of become more of a vocal leader of this team? Does Pat Coogan step into that role? Can he step into that role if he's battling for a position? You know, who are the guys that do that? That's a big question mark on offense. And that's a that's going to be a storyline is who steps up and becomes the leaders of the team. So I put up the wrong question there. So that's going to be that's going to be the biggest one for me. Uh, how does Riley Leonard look this spring's a big storyline? 
position battles, the number two quarterback position battle is going to be huge. That's the only position battle that's really heavy. Look, Notre Dame may give us lip service about, oh, there's a quarterback battle and, you know, Riley's going to earn it. And that's true. I mean, if Riley comes out and stinks, he's not going to start. But, guys, none of those quarterbacks are in position about cha- to battle Riley Leonard unless he's hurt. That's just the reality of it. He's just better than they are right now. The battle is number for number two. Who's going to be number two? Who's going to put themselves in position to be that backup quarterback this year that if Riley goes down, they're stepping in because whoever finishes number two this year is going to be in position to, to, to be in pole position going into spring next year. Doesn't mean they're guaranteed to win it, but it certainly helps because they're going to get a lot more work during the season. So that's an important part of it. That's that's a battle. Will how does Who's going to play where at receiver? Part of that's going to be determined by who the coach is like. Part of that's going to be determined by who battles, who steps up, who makes plays this spring. You know, what's the what's it going to look like at guard? I mean, you've got Billy Shrouth and Pat Coogan into the year starting guards. When's Rocco Spindler going to be back? Will he be able to battle this spring? Most likely not because he's in the same boat Mitch Levins is. Actually got hurt later, and he's 300-pounder. He's a guy that may not be back until fall camp or even into the season. But if he's – you know, what what – so who steps into that void? Are they going to give some younger guys like Sam Pendleton a chance to push for starting jobs? Sullivan Absher to push for a starting job. Ty Chan, does a guy like him break out? That's going to be a quite a much bigger question mark for me. Does Joe, if Joe Odding has a great spring, does he kind of say, hey, I've got to play, so I'm going to be the center and they're going to move Ashton to guard or something like that? Like I don't know who that's going to be, but that interior battle is going to be interesting to watch. And then right tackle, who, who who's going to win that battle? Is Tosh just going to maintain it at right tackle? Does Emil Wagner push him? Can Selvin Abster push him? This spring, those are going to be very good questions and things that I'm going to be looking for on offense. Defense is is, is similar stuff. You're going to have a battle at the defensive end. I mean, R.J. Oban and Josh Byrne are both going to play. Does R.J. kind of come in and take the starting job over? Does Josh take it over? You know, what's the depth chart looking like at Viper? Does Jordan Bezoho step up this spring? Can Bubakar Traore push Junior Tualamaka for that number two job? That's going to be an interesting one. Linebacker is going to be an interesting one. There's going to be a lot of guys battling for those number two and number three starting jobs there. You know, safety with Rod Hurd not here this spring is a big storyline for me on defense. Who kind of steps up to that? Is it, I mean, a Don Schuler's guy I'm high on. I know there's a question about him in the in there, so I'll talk about that. Does Luke Talich, if he's able to get back from injury, can he be a guy that kind of – pushes himself to the front of the line and say, hey, I'm that either I'm going to start over Rod Hurd or if Rod Hurd comes back and is a starter, I'm that next guy off the bench type of guy uh, at the at the safety position. So those are going to be some of the battles and storylines that you come out. And, and how does the defense adjust? This is a big one for me, big storyline. How's the defense going to adjust with the losses they had, right? Are you going to ask Drake Bowen to be the same kind of, you know, I don't say leader, you're going to ask him to have the same grasp of the defense as a sophomore that you asked J.D. Bertrand to do as a fifth-year senior? I, I hope not. It, but how much can Drake handle? How much can can you know, can Jalen Seed handle? How much can Kingston handle? How much can Jaden Osberg handle? How much can Preston Zinner handle? Whoever those guys are going to be, how are they going to be able to handle that? And then what adjustments do they have to make on defense to overcome the fact that they don't have – a bunch of fifth-year senior linebackers and six-year senior safety that can kind of get everybody lined up. And what impact does that have on on how they approach teams week after week? But that foundation gets laid during the spring. Here's that question from Madon Shula that we we're talking about. This is from Iden Benami. Iden asks, Brian, seems like over the past few months you've been very high on Adon Shuler and his potential. Is he who you're most looking forward to take a jump? Well, I wouldn't say that I've been very high on him the last months. I've liked Adon a, a lot, but I have talked a lot about him. It's not so much that I'm I'm, I'm expecting him to take a jump because I, I really don't know who will, and that wasn't the question you asked, who I'm most looking forward to. It's more about – with my conversation about Don, it's he needs to take a jump. They need him to to be that year two breakout player. They need Luke Talich and Ben Minnick to step up because the depth chart at safety is very, very thin. Who I'm lo- lo- most looking forward to, so I'm, I'm going to take this question I did to mean like who, like looking forward to from the standpoint of if this guy breaks out, it has a huge impact on the team. Defensively, Josh Burnham, uh, Drake Bowen, and Jaden Osbury. 
Jalen Sneed. All you need two of those three to really break out this spring. Christian Gray at corner, Don Schuler and Luke Talich at safety are guys that I'm very, very much looking forward to. And then another one that's going to fly under the radar a little bit is Micah Bell. He's a guy that I'm very much looking forward to seeing this year in, in on defense. Offensively, I'd love to see Charles Jagas all take a big step. I'm looking forward to seeing Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price kind of step into that void at running back and see a big jump. Jaden Greathouse is a guy at receiver that I think is going to make a really big jump this spring. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what he's going to do this spring. So there's definitely some guys that I'm looking forward to. Eli Raritan, can he stay healthy? You know, can he can he get out there and kind of turn his potential into you know production productive play? That's another guy that I'm looking forward to. And then just overall offense, the young offensive lineman. It, it, I don't care if it's Sam Pendleton or or Ty Chan or Emil Wagner or Sullivan Absher or Christopher Tarek or Joe Otting. I really don't care who it is. They just need, or if it's even freshmen like Peter Jones you know, or Styles Prescott, I don't really care who those guys are, but they're going to need those young guys to step up this offseason, at the very least to push the veterans, if not flat beat them out. That's going to be a big, big question. Big, big question this spring. Riker Ferg, Nike, Jordan, UA, and Adidas offer your client signature shoe deals. What conversations would you have with your client? I, I'm not an agent. I, I couldn't begin to tell you what that conversation would look like. I mean, it, look, you know my stance on Jordan and Nike. I, I'm, I, I would want no part of them, but that's not my job. It's to offer, here's the deals, with the conversations with my client are, are no nothing more than this. Here's the financial deals. Here's the things you have to consider. Do you have a preference on on you know who you want to go with? Okay, this the, you know UA Adidas may be offering you the biggest deal, but you're a you know you're a night guy when it comes to what you wear in your performance. Are you able to make that switch? Those type of things. I mean, those are the only conversations that I would be having with him because my personal opinion on those companies doesn't matter unless he shares a similar opinion on that. Would I maybe have some conversations with him about it? Probably would make sense to do so, but you know, that that's not my job would not be my job in my opinion. If I was an agent, Tyler long break with a question. Thank you, Tyler doomsday scenario. All four quarterbacks get hurt. Who plays next a walk-on or Buckner? Well, since Buckner's on the football team, it'd be a walk-on. It'd be Dylan Devison or Anthony Rezac, or maybe they move somebody to quarterback and, you know, running some kind of uh read zone thing. But fortunately, no, we're not going to have to experience that or figure that out. USMA87 with a question. What is Jordan Faison better at, football or lacrosse? I don't know how to evaluate him as lacrosse. I know he's much considered a much, much higher ranked lacrosse player than football player, and he's been pretty good from what I've seen with the lacrosse team. I think Jordan Faison's a very good football player. I think some of the feelings we have about him are, are, are as much about the storyline as they are necessarily him being a great player. I think Jordan Faison is a guy that's a good football player. He's going to help this football team. Would I count him as a lock to be like the starter at this or that? No, probably not. Uh, lacrosse, it seems like he's a star from what I can tell, but I, I really don't know enough about that position to say, hey, he's that guy. Because like he finished the year great. Jaden Greathouse started the year great. You know, They're both very good players. Who's going to be the guy that takes that next step? I don't know. That's going to be another storyline, but right now I would say probably lacrosse. He's better at lacrosse. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that'll be the case in a year or two, because I think lacrosse has been more of a focus for him working out wise and mentally. The, he may go out this year and have great success football and be like, Hey, listen, if I'm the best lacrosse player in the country, this is how much money I'm going to make after Notre Dame. But if I'm a turn out to be a pretty darn good wide receiver, and can work my way into a day two, day three draft pick. I can make this amount of money. I need to focus more of my time on football. He may have that conversation and all of a sudden be, become better football. But right now, I think lacrosse is the one that carries the day for him. Iden Benami says, do you think we can increase our sacks by 10 or more this season? I think our D-line is going to wreak havoc. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, if you look at – if you look at where Notre Dame was last year in 2023 compared to where it was the year before, they had what was it, an eight, seven sack drop off. So could they could they do better than at least 10 more than last year to get to 41? Certainly it's possible. I, I just 
to me, that doesn't necessarily, like, here's the deal. I, I made this case when I was breaking down last year's pass rush. I mean, 2022, Notre Dame had 38 sacks. 2023, Notre Dame had 31 sacks. I would, sh- I, it's not even, to me, it's not even that debatable. The pass rush in 2023 was much better than the pass rush in 2022. Now, the sack numbers may not show it, but there's a lot of other numbers that show it. And and I know that that we obsess over sacks. I get why. I completely get why. Because it's a tangible metric for us to look at. We can look at sacks. We had five sacks in this game versus no sacks in that game. And it's going to tell you a certain story. But when you look at the, the overall pressures this past year, I mean, Notre Dame had 267 pressures this past season. And in the year before, Notre Dame had 225. In 2022, according to Pro Football Focus, Notre Dame had 84 total hits plus sacks on the quarterback. And in 2023, they had 92 combined hits plus sacks on the quarterback. So a much more effective pass rushing team this past year. So they could be, to your point, a a wreak havoc and be a better pass rushing team. And it doesn't necessarily manifest itself in 10 plus more sacks per game. Uh, So, but it also could. I mean, it could, to your question, it could. And and ideally, it's a little bit of both, right? Like, they're a much more disruptive team. Because, like, the pressures last it took them probably four or five games to really kind of catch their stride. And then once Al Golden turned them loose, they were much, much better throughout the year. Maybe they just kind of hit the ground running this year, and they're just the team we saw in the last seven games just all year. That is going to manifest itself in more sacks, no question. How many more? That's a good question. Ideally, it like you said, it's it's a little bit of both. When you look at where Notre Dame stacked up last year from a sack standpoint, you know they had 31, 41 sacks. Just getting them to 10 plus more would raise them from being 39th or 42nd in sacks last year to ninth, tied with ten, for ninth with Tennessee. So just a 10 sack difference is a big, big difference. You start getting any more than 10. And you're talking about you're creeping up towards the top five in sacks. So that would be great. And I could see them doing more. I just think, to your point, Iden, they could be a lot more disruptive and it not have a huge change in the sack numbers. I think where you'll see a big change is continued low completion percentage, high pass breakups, high turnover rate, things like, you know, more forced fumbles. You know, that like that's an that's a part of it, right? Like, did Notre Dame have as many sacks last year? No. Did they force more fumbles? Yeah. Did they force some interceptions? Yeah. Did they have more pass breakups? Yeah. All those things are indicative of a team who was pressuring the opposing offense in a lot of different ways. And and that's something that's going to be a factor in it in in the overall numbers of season. Got another one from God Country, Notre Dame and Barbecue. And the question is, if Riley Leonard wins the Heisman, what will his stats be? How many points a game will Notre Dame average? And what is the end result of the season playoff? This is a good one. So we've talked about this. If Riley Leonard simply repeats the production he had in 2022, he's probably a top five Heisman guy. And I, I've point, I've it, well, I left a very important part of this out. If Riley Leonard repeats the production he had at Duke from 2022 this season, and Notre Dame is also a playoff team, you know, top six to eight team, Riley Leonard's probably a Heisman top five guy, right? I mean, I, I pointed out last year, Jalen Milrow, I believe, finished fifth. Let me just uh, – Pull this up. I believe Jalen Milrow finished fifth in Heisman Trophy voting. Let me just pull it up just to make sure. So go to Jalen Milrow, sixth, one spot behind Jordan Travis. Okay, that's a good example to use. We'll we'll use Jordan Travis in this one as well. So Riley Leonard in 2022, in 13 games, passed for 2,967 yards. Jalen Milrow, give me a sec. Jalen Milrow this past season. In 13 games, passed for 2,834 yards. That's fewer than Riley Leonard in the same amount of games. J- Jordan Jordan Travis passed for 2,756 yards uh, compared to in 11 games. So even though he played 11 games, he still finished fifth in Heisman voting. 
Uh, Riley Leonard passed for 20 touchdowns. Jalen Milrow at 23. Jordan Travis at 20. Riley Leonard had 699 rushing yards and 13 touchdowns. Jalen Milrow had 531 rushing yards and 12 touchdowns, so fewer. So Jalen Miller had fewer overall yards and only two more touchdowns than Riley Leonard, and he was number six in Heisman voting. Jordan Travis rushed for only 176 yards and seven touchdowns. So so Jordan Travis last year had 2,932 yards of total offense and 27 touchdowns and finished fifth in Heisman voting. Riley Leonard beat those numbers in 2022, but he played for Duke. So if he just repeats those numbers, he's top five. Your question was, what does he then would have to do to win it? Number one, Notre Dame has to be a top five team. Top five to six team, be very good throughout the year. Riley Leonard has to play very well in the big moments. That means he has to play very well on the road against Texas A&M. He has to play very well against uh, Florida State. He has to play very well against USC at the end of the year and possibly Louisville. Those spotlight money games are going to be key. And he can't afford to not have those because they don't have a ton of those games as of right now. And then those are important. And then the numbers. To me, if he's around 3,000 to 3,200 yards passing and creeping up on 25 to 30 touchdowns passing, and he rushes for six to 700 yards, and has at least 10 plus touchdowns rushing. I think that's about where he'll be. Uh, those numbers aren't going to necessarily blow you away compared to others, but again, he'd be the quarterback at Notre Dame. I've pointed this out before Notre Dame. I mean, you look at last year, you look at some of the quarterbacks that were in there last year, Jalen Milrow, those numbers would smash, smash anything Jordan, Jalen Milrow and, in uh, Jordan Travis had now they're, they're not anywhere close to what guys like Jaden Daniels and Michael Penix and Bo Nix had. But I think that that Notre Dame bump would, uh, would help him a little bit there. We've seen past years where the, where the quarterbacks have been closer to kind of what he did, you know, Max Dugan two years ago threw for 3,698 yards. But a lot of that was, was done after the, the um, Heisman trophy was handed out. And again, why was why did Max Dugan finish second in Heisman Trophy voting in 2022? Was he the second best player in college football? No, he wasn't. But he was a starting quarterback on one of the best teams in the country. And that year, Max Dugan had 3,698 uh, yards. But let's see here. At the end of the regular season, he was at 3,698 minus 225 minus 152. He was at 3,300 yards and 30 touchdowns passing. And then rushing wise, he was at 423 minus 19. He was at 404 rushing yards and six touchdowns. So guy finished number two, numbers that are comparable to what Riley Leonard would do, but Riley Leonard would be doing it with Notre Dame, not TCU. So I think he'd have to be on the higher end of some of those passing numbers. If he goes beyond that and Notre Dame's a playoff team, he has a really good shot. Like if he's at like, let's say like 3,500 passing yards and 30 touchdowns, and he rushes for 500 yards and 10 touchdowns, and Notre Dame's a top five team, he'll have a very good chance. Because I don't think you're going to see uh, a Jaden Daniels type of season this year quarterback from anybody. I, I don't know who's that guy's going to be other than maybe Riley Leonard. I don't know who um, – you know, I, I don't see anyone having a Michael Penix type of year at a big time school. I'd have to kind of look through, but I just it's not a year where there's a lot of established quarterbacks. That's an, a key thing. You know, Quinn Ewers is going to have a chance to to got to be a guy that put up puts up some really good numbers and kind of jumps into that conversation. I think their team is going to be very good. I think Texas is going to be a top 10 team. So they'll have a shot to to be in that conversation there. You know, and he's a guy that comes in with that reputation. But if you look at it from last year. All of the quarterbacks that finished in the top 10 in voting, there were six of them. Only one of them comes back, and that's Jalen Milrow. And I, I don't know how good he's going to be in that system. Actually, of the top 10 vote getters, I think only two of them, period, come back. I believe Ollie Gordon is coming back for Oklahoma State. I believe I could be wrong on that. Uh, somebody in the chat correct me if I'm if I'm wrong on that one. But uh you know, I, I could see something like that. Somebody mentioned Dylan Ab Dylan Gabriel could go off. I mean, possibly, but I don't know that Dylan Gabriel, number one, Dylan Gabriel's got to prove he can stay healthy. But I don't see Dylan Gabriel matching the production that 
that Bo Nix had at Oregon. I just I don't I don't think he's as I just don't think he's as good as Bo Nix. I think the the weapons around him are going to be good, but they got a lot of guys to replace them. There's no Troy Franklin. There's no Bucky Irving. They're going to saw some good players, but I just I don't see Dylan Gabriel passing for 4,500 yards and 45 touchdowns with three picks at Oregon, and and rushing for you know six more touchdowns and being healthy a, a whole season. I just don't see it. I like Dylan Gabriel. He'll put up numbers, but I think his numbers will be more in line with what he did at Oklahoma: 3,600 passing yards, 30 t- 30 to 35 touchdowns six interceptions. So I don't see him having those monster, monster numbers like Bo Nix had uh, this past season, especially since he's going to be in a new offense. So I, I think it'll be some, somewhere along those lines, in my opinion. Uh, D-Rock Irish said, I wish the Heisman vote was after the college football season. Here's why I'm going to – I'm gonna. Uh, Ryan just said that Ollie, Ollie Gordon is back. So uh, I, that is correct. So only two of the top ten vote getters. The reason I say no to that, is because you're almost guaranteeing that the Heisman Trophy is going to go to one of the semifinalists or championship team. And it already does enough of that, in my opinion, uh, to to say, hey, it's already slanted towards those teams anyway. Like, to me, the odds of Jaden Daniels having a chance to win the Heisman Trophy would be way less if you did it that way. I, I'm, I'm totally fine with certain awards being regular season awards. That's what they're meant to be. You can give a, a playoff MVP out, like the college NCAA tournament does that, right? There's a tournament MVP. It's a completely different thing because now you're also arguing with, for some people, from a sense of, of you don't know what certain guys would have done. Like a guy could be the best player in college football and his team plays one postseason game because they weren't a playoff team or they lose in the first round and he may have a big game, but then this other guy gets to play three, four games because his team is better. And those guys get pumped up the awards rankings. And I don't think that really gives us a genuine taste of who's better. I mean, I understand the whole postseason thing, but like certain guys not playing as well in the postseason can have as much to do with his team's just not as good as it does. Oh, see, he gets on that big stage and he's not that good of a player. Well, he carried a team an entire year. He gets to the postseason, he's going against his team where they're just better everywhere else. and He doesn't play well. That shouldn't mean that that guy still wasn't the best player in college football. So I think it would taint it a lot more than it already is tainted. I mean, it already is tainted very much. I mean, we talked about this. It's a very much a quarterback-driven award. It's very much a quarterback to the better teams in the country award. That's why I was kind of happy Jaden Daniels won it last year because it didn't go to you know, a guy that was playing for one of the top teams and, and, and those type of things. It's always going to go to a highly ranked team. I mean, Caleb Williams – production this year was still very good and it wasn't what it was the year before but I mean Caleb Williams this past year did not finish did he even finish in the top 10 in Heisman voting no Caleb Williams did not finish in the top 10 in Heisman voting for one reason and one reason only his team sucked I mean let's be honest about that Caleb Williams went out this year and passed for 3,633 yards, had 30 touchdowns and five interceptions, and rushed for 11 touchdowns. How is that any worse than what J.J. McCarthy did at Michigan? J.J. McCarthy this past year, in in 15 games, threw for 2,991 yards passing, rushed for 202 yards, and had 25 total touchdowns. Caleb Williams had 41 touchdowns in 12 games. Blew his numbers away. He was a far more dynamic player and a far better player than J.J. McCarthy. Why was J.J. McCarthy a top 10 Heisman vote getter and Caleb Williams, the reigning champ, was not in the top 10? Why? Because his team sucked. And so it's already slanted to me towards that. I I don't want to see it get slanted even more so to that. Because I just, I think it now just becomes a, okay, the Heisman Trophy voting is now just basically going to the MVP of the playoff. That's what it's going to turn into. So I would rather do that, have the MVP that's for the regular season plus conference championship games if you want, and then have a, a playoff MVP that, that is given to the, the guy who, who was the best player in the college football playoff, which will you know be somebody from one of the winning teams. I'd much rather see that than the other way around because that 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 makes it more of a team award in my opinion so i i understand the sentiment i do but that's where i would go with it 
Aiden Benami says, I think Audric Estime is a football player, not a time tester. In between those lines, he's exactly what a running back football player is. Don't care if you run a 4-7. I tend to agree. We had some questions about Audric Estime from this. Uh, Chris W. with an incredible overreaction. Will Audric Estime go undrafted? No. I mean, guys, Kyron Williams, who was not did not have the kind of season that Audric had this year, ran a 4-6-5 and had a uh, an almost identical 10-yard split number to Audric and he went in the 5th round. Could this could this impact Audric's draft standing? Of course it could. I'm not going to say that it won't. I mean 4-7 is not good. But his other numbers were were pretty good and the film was going to say something and there's comps to this, right? Like who was the guy the Seahawks had a couple years ago that was a pretty good running back? I believe he's a pretty good running back Chris Carson, right? Didn't he run like a 4-7? Uh, you know, he was a guy that was a pretty good player when he was healthy. You know, he's he Audric's con- yeah, 2000 yard seasons before the injury set in. Audric's comparable to him. They're gonna look at the film. And, and the other thing, too, is what helps players like Audric today that wasn't there five, 10 years ago is all the GPS data. So there's so much more available to scouts to say, hey, listen, I know the guy ran a four seven, but we have this data from this. That shows in games he played this way. Perfect example is this. And we didn't have this five years ago. And it makes my point so much. I'm watching Keon Coleman run a 4-6. I watched Troy Franklin run a 4-4-1. Then I watched them go through drills. And as they're going through the gauntlet, I see two things. Number one, they had the GPS stuff. So Keon Coleman was running much faster through the drills than Troy Franklin was running through the drills. But he was going on a straight line where Troy Franklin was weaving away from the ball every time. That tells me something. Keon Coleman can play fast and has phenomenal ball skills and phenomenal confidence in his skills. Guys that weave away from the ball. So what I mean by that is if if the ball's coming from my right, I drift to my left, catch the ball, and then I now drift back this way, giving myself more time to catch the ball. You never teach a receiver to drift away from the ball, ever never drift away from the ball. So do I care more that that on Troy Franklin, who's a good player, by the way, the kid from Oregon, he's a good football player, don't get me wrong. Do I care more about the fact that, uh, that he ran a faster 40 time than Keon Coleman? Or do I care more about the fact that when I watch these kids play, Keon's just a more dominant player, a physically dominant player. He plays faster in certain drills. Those are all the things you have to look at and make those decisions. But there's just more of that data available now than there was in the past that I think people are going to be able to look at. So you can look at GPS data for Audric and say, hey, because in the past you'd have that, well, the guy just plays fast. But you have no way to, to, to gauge that transition. But nowadays you can look at the GPS data and say, hey, listen, he does play faster. He was running this many miles per hour in the 40-yard dash. He was running this many miles per hour when he was running for an 80-yard touchdown against NC State or an 80-yard touchdown against a 70-yard touchdown against Central Michigan, that kind of thing. But to think that he's going to go undrafted because he, he ran a, a slower 40 time, to me, is just an, an exceptional overreaction to that. Uh, absolutely exceptional overreaction to, to, to his combine performance and what the expectations were. I'm not saying it's good, but let's not forget he had a 158 split at that size. He did 38 inch vertical jump, very good. 10 foot, 10 five broad jump, very good. And that's kind of what made it a little bit strange. Because the 471 40 time didn't really track with some of the other explosive explosive numbers. And, and that's what kind of made it a little bit interesting. If you look at Audric's, uh, his his 40, his vertical jump was tied for fourth best of, of all the guys there. His his broad jump was, I think, fifth. Let me pull that up. I think tied for fifth. Yeah, no, also tied for fourth best there. So when you look at his those numbers, you would think a better 40 time is coming. So I think the fact that Audric did really well in those other areas is going to help him kind of overcome that. That doesn't mean he won't slide a little bit with some people. Some teams care more about speed than others, but to act as if he's going to go from and somebody said like he's going to he went from around two to three to around six or seven guys. That's not how the draft works. I'm sorry, especially for a 230 pound running back. That's just that's not how how it works. Anthony Solomon, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I appreciate that. Very, 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 very much. Let's get back to some more questions here. This this is a fun one. Who would make the most NIL money if it existed in their playing days? Rocket Ismail, Deion Sanders, or Tim Tebow? 
uh, easily Tim Tebow, like easily, because there's so much more money available when he played. I mean, Rocket and Dion and Coach Prime played at the same time. They were both late 80s. I think Dion's last year was 89. Rocket's was 90. They played at the same era. And they would have made a lot of money then, but you know, making a, a how much would a million dollars in 1989 be in 2007 and 2008, 2009 when Tim Tebow was playing? Now, if you're going to talk about like, you know, when you take in inflation into account, I still think it's Tim Tebow. Two reasons. One, he's quarterback. He's a quarterback in the South. He's a quarterback that was a media darling. Media loved him. That Rocket and Dion got, they got media love, but they never like Tim Tebow got. I mean, at all. Nothing goes to what team Tim Tebow got. So quarterbacks are always going to make more in those type of situations. Got lots of more great questions today, guys. Really enjoying this mailbag so far. Going to get to, uh, to to some more of these. We got one from Ball Peen Shalala. Assuming Notre Dame wins a national championship in the 12-team playoff format, what four matchups would you give them in each round of the playoff to create the best storybook natty? Oh, wow, that's a good one. Okay, so the the best storylines for me would be let me just let me just give me some time to work through this so I can make sure that I'm really thinking through it. Number one is they play LSU in the first round. So Notre Dame's the five seed, LSU's the 12. Let's say they're the fourth best team in the SEC. They get in in that 12 mark. The group of five champion is ranked ahead of them. Who who that be? I don't know, but let's just say they're 12. Notre Dame's the five. Brian Kelly gets to come to, has to come to Notre Dame Stadium. Marcus Freeman against his old boss. Notre Dame hosting their first ever playoff game against their former coach, who's the all-time wins leader. I mean, just that storyline alone would be great. You could, you could make LSU be a later game. That's fine. You know, beat them in the championship. I don't really care. First of all, I don't want Brian Kelly to get to the championship game. Uh, and I, but I think the whole Brian Kelly coming back to Notre Dame Stadium angle would be better, a better storyline for me than beating them in the championship. And I'll get to that one. Next two rounds, I would say, you know, because we're talking about 2024 or 25, I don't see Michigan being in there. So let's say in round two, Notre Dame plays Texas. Reason I'm going with Texas is it's, it's a it's a big name. It's an up and coming program. Two youngish coaches vying for supremacy in the college football world. Offensive minded coach and Steve Sarkeesian against a defensive minded coach. Uh, Notre Dame obviously looking for a little payback against Sark, who just ripped them up in 2020. Obviously before Marcus Freeman got there, you'd have brand recognition. Uh, that would be a, a, a you, you want to get through some big teams at that point in time. So I'd, I'd go Texas number the, the next semifinals. I'm going to play Ohio State and the semifinals. Notre Dame. I think the Buckeyes are the number one seed. So you play you play the, the Notre Dame's the five. So they played four Texas. The Buckeyes win their game their their quarterfinal game. They are the one seed. Notre Dame plays them in the semis. Notre Dame beats Ohio State. You finally get that monkey off your back. That would be a great storyline. You're battling for supremacy in the North. Again, we're talking about storylines, right? That was the biggest thing, the storybook season. You know, you beat that team that you haven't beat since the 1930s, that, that just that monkey off of your back. You win that one. And then, to me, it's in the championship game, you're playing either Georgia or Alabama. And I think now it's got to be Georgia. If Saban was still at Bama, it's Bama. Beating Bama with Kalen DeBoer doesn't have the same storybook feel as beating Georgia with Kirby. So you'd want to go Georgia with Kirby. So that, for a storybook, that would be it. And, and the reason I went with that over, you know, playing somebody else is because I don't want I don't want to get to the championship because somebody else knocked off Ohio State or somebody else knocked off Georgia or somebody else knocked off LSU or Texas. I want to I want to you know, I want I, I'm a king of the hill kind of guy, right? Like if I want to be the king of the hill, I want to fight off all the top people to get there. I don't want it to be like the NCAA tournament where you know like. Think of like the Fab Five, for example. Great story, great team. They earned their final four, their championship game run. But I've often thought, what happens if Arizona doesn't get knocked off by East Tennessee State in the first round of the NCAA tournament? 
I've often thought that because I think that I, I think that I think um, I'm pulling this up, but I'm pretty sure that was the Chris Mills was on that team, I believe. I'm pulling this up now. Let me just get uh, Sean Rooks. Yeah, Chris Mills was on that team. Sean Rooks was on that team. He's a big guy. You had Khalid Reeves was on that team. Um, let me see here. East Tennessee State beat them in the first round. Great. You mentioned some really good players from back then. So Damon Stoudemire was a freshman on that team, played a bunch. It was a great Arizona team. They were the three seed. And they got upset by East Tennessee State. The Fab Five, to me, grew confidence as they won more and more games that season. And would they have been able to build that if Arizona doesn't get upset in the first round? So, like, I, that's that's fine. That's a great storyline. But for me, I just want to get there because you beat the best. I don't want to give anybody any talking points of, well, yeah, but, but that's because the 12-team playoff, some team upset Georgia, like this year, right? Oh, Georgia would have beat anybody in the college football playoff. And we, we just like Georgia because they they went and beat a Florida State team. They beat basically Georgia went out and beat Florida State's second and third team by 60. That's basically what happened. Let's be honest about that. And so now I gotta hear this. Well, you know, Georgia, you know, they 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 were so good and and they would have beat Michigan. And they really like did you guys watch Georgia at like at all during the season? Like, did you watch them get whooped by Bama in the trenches? And then did you watch what Michigan did to Bama? in the trenches and all of a sudden Georgia's is going to be this, this dominant team. Like you, the guys, this ain't 2022 Georgia, this ain't 2021 Georgia, right? This is a Georgia team that was losing to South Carolina 14 to three at halftime. This is a Georgia team that, that barely beat that needed a second half comeback to beat Auburn. This is a Georgia team that once again, did not necessarily wipe out Missouri again. I mean, this, this is a good Georgia and they look like doo-doo against Georgia tech as well. Right, let, let's not create this mythical Georgia team that didn't exist that would have just wiped the mat, every, you know, the mat with everybody else was in the playoff. No, th- th- maybe they would have, but but there's nothing to say, boy, like this team would have done this, boy, man, they would have. No, no, they wouldn't have because they were never that team all year. And so uh, I don't want to have any of those excuses. Oh, well, you only won because Georgia got upset or Ohio State got upset by so and so. I don't want any of that. I don't want any of that. I want to beat the best. Is your Notre Dame? You want to beat the best. Now, it doesn't mean you got to play all four of them. As long, but as long as you, here's the thing: as long as you beat Ohio State and Georgia, there's not going to be people will say the people can say things no matter what, but they're going to look ignorant, and and that's really what I care about, in my opinion. So that that would be this. It's a great. It's a fun question. That would be the storybook season for me. You could maybe put Michigan in there, but I, you guys know my stand. I don't really care about Michigan. You could maybe have some fun and say, well, you know, what if you have to play like. Miami, but like that, that's more pie in the sky because Miami's not that good right now, in my opinion. Michael Pate, the question, which side of the ball do you predict to be more successful this year, offense or defense? Which position group are you most worried about and which group are you most confident in both sides? It's a very layered question. Which side do I think is going to be better? I, it's hard for me to say right now the offense is going to be better because there's so many unknowns. I think the offense has a chance to end up being the best part of this football team. But they, there's a long way to go. To I mean, we got to see what kind of transition Matt Riley Mills, uh, Leonard makes. How does the offensive line come together? Who steps up a receiver? There's so many unanswered questions. Could it be better? Yes, it could. But right now, I'm much more confident the defense is going to be the best group. The, the, what you're hoping for is not not so much is this group better than that group. It's a fun conversation, Michael, and I, and I enjoy the question, but it's more so is the offense good enough when it matters most to help you go win a championship? But I still, as of now, expect the defense to be better. Ask me this again in May. I may change my mind after we go through the spring and the offense has a great spring, but right as of right now, uh, I'm more focused. I think the offense is better. Which position group am I most worried about? Well, one of the shows we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to rank position groups now that we're in the spring. We're going to have a pre-spring spring, and then a post-spring kind of a ranking of the position groups. Right now, the group that I'm most concerned about is the safety position, just because, number one, I mean, right now, uh, let me let me pull this up real quick because I'm, I'm working on making the spring previews, and I have all the projected depth charts done. And I was going over these last night, kind of creating the, the shells for all these stories and creating the – the projected depth charts and all that kind of stuff. And I was looking at the safety depth chart. I was like, you know, just looking at it for the spring, like this is a little bit concerning. 
because of you know injuries and some guys aren't, aren't here yet and all these other kind of things. When you look at this projected depth chart for safety, you've got four scholarship players on the roster. One of them is freshman Kennedy or Wagner. Now I kind of look at Luke Callis like a scholarship guy, so you could say five, but he's coming off an injury. So it's Xavier Watts, Don Schuler, Ben Minnick, Luke Callis, and Kennedy or Wagner. That's a major question outside of Xavier Watts. Is how how healthy is Luke Callis this spring? You know, does Adon Schuler take a step up? Can Ben Minnick stay healthy? Can Luke Callis get healthy and stay healthy? Those are all very fair questions. Now, there's some talent there. I, I, it would not shock me at all if Adon Schuler is the guy that is the, the starter opposite Xavier Watts coming out of spring. It wouldn't shock me at all. It wouldn't shock me if Luke Callis is that guy. It really wouldn't. You know, but you're going to need some of those guys to step up. But right now, to me, that's the that's the easily the biggest question mark that I have on the entire football team. Uh, going into the spring. Now, it'll, I'll feel a little bit better in the fall, assuming the young guys stay healthy and, and continue growing because you're going to get Rod Hurd in and, you know, and, and you're going to be good there. But it, it's, a, it's a shame. You could count Jordan Clark there, but Jordan Clark's not playing safety. Jordan Clark's playing nickel. Yes, he could play there, but right now he's not protected to play there. Which group am I most confident in on both sides of the ball? I'm very confident in the running back position group. Loads of talent. Somebody's going to be good there. And I'm very confident in the defensive line. Uh, th- those are the two that I'm probably most confident. Corner maybe could could push the defensive line. Since there are some questions at end, you know, how does Jordan Toho step up? What's the back we're going to look like? Who's going to start at big end? I'm just pretty confident there. If you wanted to go with cornerback, I wouldn't push back on you at all. I just need to see Jaden making those guys do it a little bit, you know, as the, as the guy. But it's close between D-line and corner. As, as the ones I'm most confident on defense. But I'm leaning towards D-line just because there's more. I've seen it there. We've seen it from Benjamin Morrison. We know he's a dude. But D-line, I know who Riley Mills is. I know who Howard Cross is. And I know who R.J. Oban is. I know at the very least what the backups can do. I know who Jordan Soho is you know, at the very least. And so there's some, there's some level of I expect this D-line to at least be as good as it was last year. Can it be better? We'll find out. It's not a – We talk, I talked about this in the cornerback preview last week. The cornerback position could end up being better in 2024 than it was in 2023. But they're not right now. You start the spring, in my opinion, on the D-line, better than where you were last year, in my opinion. Cornerback, you're not. You could get there. But Christian Gray and Jane Mickey have a lot to prove before we're going to say they are better than Cam Hart. They could be better than Cam, but they're not right now. That's cer- certainly not right now. So, But they're still very good. And so that's why I that's why I lean towards the defensive ball. But I'd be totally understandable if you went somewhere else. I'd be curious to see in the chat what you guys think. What is the position group on offense you're most confident in and the one you have the biggest question mark about? Offensively, my biggest question mark is the offensive line. Just because it's young, there's a lot that we need to see proven there. Who plays where? I'm I'm pretty confident receivers are gonna step up. I really am. I'm very confident in running back, very confident quarterback. Tight end's going to be fine. I mean, they're, they're going to be good this spring without Mitchell Evans. And then when you get Mitchell Evans back in the fall and, and he's your best guy, like, you're going to be really good there. A lot of confidence in those groups. It's it's really the O-line that I'm, I'm most curious about to me. So that that's where I'm at on that one. Good questions. I'd like to hear what you guys think about it, though. It'd be fun to fun discussion. Christopher Crosby, good question. Christopher asks, what are you most looking for? Thing in spring practice. It's not one thing. I, I was just talking about one, obviously, the offensive line. I want to see how that shakes out. I want to see how the receivers step up. I want to see Riley Leonard and CJ Carr and Kenny Mintz. You want to see what, what those guys do. I, I'm excited about seeing those guys. Defensively, you know, what's the edge? Is the edge position going to be better? And how will we know if it's better or not? Like, I could see. I can see the defensive ends looking really good this spring because they're going against some young and unproven tackles, but it doesn't carry over into the fall when they're playing more experienced players. So we have to be careful, uh, in my opinion, with putting too much on the spring performance of the edge players. If they're doing this to the offensive tackles in late August, then I might start getting a little excited. Then, of course – it could be a situation where the offensive tackles really shut them down. And then you get worried, like, hold on a second. You got shut down by these young, unproven players. 
what's that going to mean? For the, it could just mean that the offensive linemen are going to be very good. That's where you, you can get real – got to be careful what happens in the spring and you don't make too much of it, right? Because it could be – I remember 2017 was a perfect example of that. And 2018 was in a different way. But 2017, we're sitting there in all camp and we're just watching the offensive line just destroy the I mean, 50-yard run after 50-yard run after 50-yard run. It didn't matter who they put in. I mean, Josh Adams won the Heisman Trophy in, the, in all camp. I mean, he was like literally rushing for a 60-yard run – all the time. Then they put Dexter Rams in. He'd go for a big run. Then they put Tony Jones in. He'd go for 30. Then they put Deion McIntosh in. He'd go for 30. And you're just like, good Lord, this D-line is garbage. And I remember Mike Elko saying, like, no, we're pretty good. That, that offensive line is just insane. I mean, he was called him, uh, I think, called, uh, called him the human lie detector, right? And, and if you weren't up to the par, they were going to let you know about it. But – it was more so about no, they were actually pretty good in the front seven. He says that offensive line was just awesome. You know what I mean? It just uh it was really, really just a dynamic group. So I, some some of you um I, I don't know what's going on. I my mic is set, so I don't know if you guys are having issues with my audio. I'm not sure there's not a lot I can do. I've got full service, my my microphone is connected and everything, so I'm not sure what, uh, what exactly I can do right now to change. It. So I apologize for that, but there's there's nothing I can do to change my audio. Everything is set according to plans. It just it just kind of is what it is. So sorry about that. Christopher Crosby also has a question. Is Utah the best team in the Big 12 walking into the conference? I've heard people say that, but it's debatable to me. I, I think so. I mean, what's what's the Big 12 going to be now, right? It's it's going to be Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and Arizona State are all joining. So of those four, Utah is the best program. You could argue that Utah was the best team in 2023. It's debatable. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm fine if you want to go there. Utah has the best team coming back. Their entire coaching staff comes back. Utah is completely remaking who they are. Uh, so I think of those four, Utah is clearly the best there. Then you, okay, who are the best teams in the league now? You know, Kansas State's in that conversation. You know, Kansas, if they can keep putting on what they're doing, could be in that conversation. TCU needs to bounce back, but you know, they've got a chance. Baylor's got a chance. Oklahoma State, to me, right now is the best team in that conference. And if, if, if you were to ask me who the best team in the Big 12 right now is, it, it would be Oklahoma State. And and I talked about this when, when Sean and I were doing our, our tiers. You look at the most wins the last 10 years, Utah right now ranks 15th. The last 10 years, Utah ranks 15th. They've won in, it's from 14 to 23. And I, I took out 2020 because for, for the Big the Pac-12, they didn't play a full season, so it doesn't count. I'm just going the last 10 years, 2020. Utah's won 9, 10, 9, 7, 9, 11, 10, 10, and 8 games for 86 wins in the, the nine years that we talked about. So I took the COVID year out. Oklahoma State ranks 11th. They've got 89 wins. They've won 7, 10, 10, 10, 7, 8, 12, 7, 10. Of the teams that are in the Big 12 now, nobody's better than that. So Oklahoma's one, Utah's two, TCU is three because they've had four 10 win seasons in that stretch. UCF is in there, but you know they're fourth. But that was and Cincinnati is fourth and fifth. But they did all their damage as group of five teams. They won six and three games last year. BYU is in that conversation. They're actually sixth. Houston is seventh. But they're all they did all that against group of five teams, a group of five schedule. Last year, in their first year for all of them in a Power Five, they won six for UCF, three for Cincinnati, five for BYU, four for Houston. So. And then tied with Houston is Kansas State at 76. They've won 9, 6, 9, 8, 5, 8, 8, 10, 9. So Kansas State's trending up. They're probably the next team for me after Oklahoma State of the returning programs as of right now. TCU could get there. But I think Oklahoma State is a very underrated and underappreciated program. I think the job Mike Gundy has done there is outstanding. Again, you look at the last 10 years, you take out the COVID year because there was so much uneven. Some teams played five, six games. Some teams played a full season. You take the 2020 season out, and you're talking about Oklahoma State being a team 
that let me just uh let me just look at this real quick i'd have to redo the numbers but yeah i mean they're they're pretty close they're borderline top 10 team right so i just i think that they are the team to me that just you look at and say you just you can't take it you can't disrespect oklahoma state you can't forget about oklahoma state and the job they've done and i just Utah is going to have to come and prove it to me. They're going to have to come and prove it to me. Uh, Kansas State is going to is a team to watch out for. If Lance Lee, the longer Lance Leopold stays at Kansas, TCU is going to be able to bounce back and recruit well. So there's programs that can, can ascend to that, but you, uh, Oklahoma State, Utah, K State to me is probably my top three of the new look Big Twelve coming into next season. That's where I would go with it. Good, good question, Christopher. Really like that one. Irish Blooded says, is that new merch you are wearing? No, it is not. It is the IB pullover. It just looks different because I'm at a different angle because I'm not on my home computer, which is more like straight ahead. You can see more. Uh, it's just a pullover, a normal pullover that we have. So this is the navy blue one. I actually wore the great one out to dinner last night. I my, my wife out to uh, Hanayori last night. For your locals, if you, you know about Hanayori, it's all you can eat seafood buffet place. Or not seafood buffet, excuse me, um, uh, Japanese steakhouse. Uh, place that, you, that we have here that we love going to. So we, we went out for a little, little date night last night. So we went to Honey York. So we're my gray one there. And then you'll see Vince rocking the white one. So this is not new merch. You can get this at the IB store um, and, uh, and and check that out. So no, not new merch. Some people have asked about the calendar as well, uh, about whether we sell that. Uh, that actually, I, I made that calendar my own. I, I had it created all with photos that my wife took at games. Somebody asked, can I sell that? No. We are not, my understanding, we are not allowed to sell photos of players that we take at games. I don't know if that's a Notre Dame rule or if that's an NCAA rule. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I just know Notre Dame doesn't allow it. And so that's why we don't sell anything with players on it. I just had that made for myself because as a background thing, because I think it's really cool. And it's all my wife took and she does a really good job. So that, that is not for sale. And then, of course, that flag is also something you can find in the store as well. So thank you for asking that question. Really good stuff today, guys. Mark Avalon, the question. I was hearing in the 14-team playoff negotiations, the development was if Notre Dame was in the top 14, they would be guaranteed one of the three at-large bids. I mean, I, I know people have said that. I know Joel Klatt says something along those lines. I can't be – I can't – I'm going to be consistent on this. I don't, I don't like at-large bids outside of the top four winners. I don't. I will never support any kind of at-large you know, automatic quality. Excuse me, I don't support automatic qualifiers outside of the four top conference champions. I don't. I don't think you should have a group of five automatic qualifier. I don't think you should have a X number for this conference or for that conference. And I don't think Notre Dame should have an automatic qualifier. As long as you rank here, you're in. Because inevitably, there's going to be years where if Notre Dame is ranked 14th and they're getting an automatic bid, they're getting in over someone who is ranked higher. That's not right. So I don't, I don't like automatic qualifiers. Outside of two to four is the most I'm giving. And I'm, I'd go four because there's still four power five. You give those champions a bid, and that's it. After that, it's get the best teams in the playoff. That's it. Get rid of the automatic qualifier for the highest ranked group of five teams. If they are one of the 12, 14 best, then let them in. But I can't say it's BS that the, these conferences get X number of automatic qualifiers, and Notre Dame does as well. If Notre Dame is not ranked high enough to get in, as far as like being a competitive team, and they are one of the 14 best teams. And, I, you know, I, I don't want them to get an automatic bid because of the entire broken system. I think it should be if they're one of the 14 best teams they're in because there's 10 at-larges and they're ranked in the top 14. That, that would be it for me. But I, I'm not a big fan of the automatic qualifiers. You know, and so I'm not going to be okay with it just because it benefits Notre Dame. Gideon Arosa asks, what do y'all think of Caitlin Clark, Clark beating the record? She's beating a lot of records. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really think, I don't really care about her beating Pistol Pete's record. It's such a useless comparison. You know, beating, beating uh, Kelsey Plum for the NCAA record, great accomplishment. Beating Lynette Woodard for the the great highest scoring women's basketball play ever because she played in what was the A, I think it was the AAIW. Because uh, I'm, I'm familiar with what that meant because I don't remember the specific words, but growing up in high school, 
you know, Old Dominion was a really good basketball team under Wendy Larry. And so we would go to women's basketball games at ODU when I was in high school. And I remember them having, like, they won some championships back then with Nancy Lieberman. So, like, they would have, I think it's AAIW national champions or Final Four or whatever, something like that. But I remember seeing that when I went to go to the And obviously when Lynette Wood was at Kansas, it was known as that, not the NCAA. But she's also passed her, and she did. She passed both those records in fewer games than those teams played, which is an accomplishment. The Pistol Pete thing is, is kind of useless for me because Pistol Pete uh, – Number one, played in an era where there's no three point shot, and and so it's kind of it's kind of hard to compare. I mean, anyone that's watched highlights of him back then knows that Pistol Pete just was would have scored at least four or five shots a game from three point line, and he 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 was just putting up crazy numbers. And when you look at when you look at Caitlin Clark's numbers, for example, she makes on average. I'm pulling this up real quick. She makes on average four three-pointers a game. So that's four extra points per game that she's making that Pistol Pete couldn't make because he didn't play in a three-point era. And Pistol Pete only played three seasons. So he he did that in three years. Caitlin Clark is best women's basketball player I've ever seen. And, and I'm not one of those, let's down on Caitlin Clark. It's just, it's a different game. I don't really care about comparing men's and women's stats. Different game, different ball. Just everything is different, different era, no three-point line. There's just no point in having that conversation. So I, I could not care less about her passing Pistol Pete because if Pistol Pete would have played four years or played with a three-point line, she wouldn't be breaking his record. But that doesn't mean it. That does, shouldn't take away anything. I still understand the need to have that conversation. Uh, just, you know, look, let's celebrate her as the greatest scoring in, uh, scorer in the, in the women's game ever. That's tremendous. Tremendous. There's nothing else – that that um, needs to be said or done. I mean, it's just it's just tremendous, and we don't need to compare to Pistol Pete or any other men to to have that comparison because it's just it's it's just useless. But she is a, a tremendous tremendous player. There's no doubt about that. She's fun to watch, and she's she's opened up the sport to so many more people that are to me getting a greater appreciation for the women's game because. Like, I've heard some silly things like, well, they should lower the rim so women can dunk. And it's like, if you need that to like the women's game, then you don't know what the women's game is about. It's a completely different game. And and I understand why there is some pushback to people, like, watching the women's game. I understand that. The whole push for, you know, getting paid more. It's just, it's a very annoying conversation. But if you understand what women's basketball is about and how the game is played, it's a great form of basketball and my it's a very enjoyable form of basketball to me because it's not played above the rim I don't want to see it played above the rim I want to see it played with passing and running sets and and setting picks and driving to the rim and shooting and skill and all those kind of things and that's Caitlin Clark is brilliant at that I mean and she's I mean and and, and she's also she's not just a score I mean her highlight if you I, I actually it's funny I showed my my wife who doesn't like basketball I showed my wife Caitlin Clark's stats the other the other day, and, or not stats, um, highlights on YouTube, and because we we have on our TV we can pull up YouTube on our TV, and so you you, you put it on and she's like, I mean my wife's going crazy like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, she didn't like basketball, you have no clue who Caitlin Clark is, but she just you could make a, a a highlights of just her passes, and you're like, wow, that that girl can ball. And then, of course, when you throw her just ridiculous shot making in there, you're like, okay, this this girl's this girl's phenomenal. So uh, she's she's incredibly fun to watch, and to me is the, like I said, the best basketball player I've ever seen. There's others you could have a conversation about. That's fine, uh, but for me, for my work, money, she is. It, like I know the UConn, the UConn set, and Rebecca Lobo, Dana Tarasi, but to me, those they were always on such great teams. They were great players, but they were on great teams. You know what would Caitlin Clark be like if she was on a, a UConn type of powerhouse team? It'd be it'd be fun to it'd be fun to watch. It'd be very fun to watch. Brandon Plesner, what's the point of conference championships and a fourteen team playoff? Basically, just to see who gets the buy, pretty much. Which it's it here. No, here we're missing the point, Brandon. Both of us missed the point initially. What's the point of conference championships? Money, making more money. That's it. That's the only reason for conference championships. It's the only reason for them. It's 
especially these 18, 20 team play league size leagues, there's no point in it. Gideon Rosa, first off, excellent talk with Josh. I loved it. I'm glad you did. But a question over under on CJ Carr, 150 yards in the blue gold game passing. I'm going to go over because I think I think the younger players are going to play a bunch. And I think CJ's going to hit a couple balls. I'm going I'm to enjoy watching CJ. So I'm going to go over because I'm in a very optimistic mood today. Very optimistic route to, uh, mood today. Gideon Rosa also asks, what team would you most like to see Notre Dame play in a home playoff game? I, I don't really care. I mean, I said it earlier. If, if there's, The only team I would really care about seeing them play here, a specific team, is um, LSU just because of all the, the things that I've talked about. So uh, that, that would be one that I'd say, okay, let's um, – you know, let, let's see that game. After that, I, I don't really, I don't really care. After that, um, I mean, yeah, Southern team, I guess, right? Um, that would really all I would care a whole lot about. So, um, yeah, yeah, don't really care about that. Hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's the whole notion of get a Southern team up here to play in December. All right, cool. But a specific team, I don't really have a preference on a specific team uh, at this point in time. Good question, though. Ronnie Reeves asks, beyond saying anything is possible, what's the possibility where our freshman wide receivers start over the transfers and veterans? What's the possibility? A barring injury, I'd say it's probably a 20% chance at best that Cam Williams starts this year. Uh, 25%, I'll say. Look, Cam's good enough to, to start this year. Uh, I would say as the season wears on, that chance increases, increases, increases most likely. But I just think the experience factor, Cam's game still needs work. Uh, and, and just so you know, like with the players that are coming back, 25% is pretty high. I mean, because he would have to beat out Jaden Greathouse, Jaden Thomas, Bo Collins, Deion Colsey, Chris Mitchell. He'd have to beat out all but one of them to start because those are all guys that are going to be playing outside. I mean, talking like in the slot guys. So that that's a lot of veteran talented players to beat out to start. So I'm, I'm going to go 20, 25% is the best. And that's only because he's an elite talent. His game, like I said, his game needs work. Still a lot to prove. I want to see him just play. I don't really care about starting. I, I don't. I want to see a five, six man rotation. I want to see Cam get his shot. I want to see them you know, take some, when he's in a game, I want to see deep balls. I want to see screens. I want to see him doing things where he's got to get guys chasing him, overs, crossers, digs, things like that, where you've got to get on his backside and try to run with him. That's what I want to see them doing. I don't really care that he plays, that he's a starter. I don't care that, and and when I mean starter, there may be some games where he's the first receiver out because they're doing like a package. We'll see that. When I mean starter, I mean he's the guy controlling the snaps of the position. That's what I kind of define as a starter. So uh, 25% would be where I where I would go with it. I, I think it's going to be hard for a freshman to come in and start, especially early in the season, maybe by the end of the year, Ronnie. Maybe, but I just want them to be ready, able to play. I just want to be good enough to help them play. That's the big key for me. That's a good question. Peter says, do you think Riley Leonard can rush for 1,000 yards like Jaden Daniels did in the Denbrock offense? Can he? Of course he can. I don't think he will. And, and the reason I say that is, is twofold. Number one, they needed Jaden Daniels to do that at LSU because they had a terrible defense. I mean, when if you're Mike Denbrock, you had to go into every game thinking, we might have to score 40 to have a chance to win this game, and that might not be enough. I mean, think about it, guys. LSU lost, game, lost a game this year where they scored 49 points. They gave up 45 against Florida State, 55 against Ole Miss, 39 against Missouri, 42 against Bama, 35 against Florida, 30 against AM, and 31 against Texas against Wisconsin. Right? That's not happening at Notre Dame. You're not going to have to score 35, 40 points every single game against a good opponent to win. So you're not going to need him to be Superman all the time. You also have a much better backfield, in my opinion, at Notre Dame than you had at LSU. Uh, at least it's certainly a more explosive backfield. And, and, and when I mean better than LSU, it's not so much that Notre Dame's players are better, but Notre Dame's backs were their best back to me missed three games last year in Logan Diggs. 
you know, Noah Kane's not the guy he was. Josh Williams is a nice player. Caleb Jackson's a nice, is a talented kid for a freshman. He's going to end up being a good player. John Emery's not what people thought he was going to be. So I just think this backfield's better. And you're not going to need Riley to do as much of the kind of running around playing hero ball that that you did with Jaden Daniels. And there's going to be more games where he's going to be out of the game. And that, that's the other part is, is I'm watching Jaden Daniels play this year. And I'm breaking down his games, and he's not really coming out of a lot of games because they're giving up so many points. I mean, he came out against Grambling. He came out against uh, Army and Georgia State. I mean, for the most part, he had to finish every other game. I, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case this year. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I just – is it possible, Peter? Absolutely. He could certainly do that. But I just don't see that. Why did that change? I think the CFB Nation guys must be doing a show or something, and they just changed all my background. So just give me a second. Got to fix this. Know what the heck they're doing. Give me a second, folks. I'm going to fix this stuff. Got to change the code. So what I do when you're doing a solo show. Sometimes you got to go in and fix some stuff. All right, there we go. We're all set again. So I have to text them and tell them not to do that. All right, so back on track. So, Peter, to answer your question, yes, he could do it. I just don't think he'll need to. Will I be shocked if he does it? No, I won't be shocked. But I don't think he'll I don't think he'll need to do that. Gideon Rosa says, Do you think Juju Lewis should be ranked higher than Bryce Underwood? Who has the better overall physical tools? No, I don't. I don't think he should be ranked higher than than Bryce Underwood. No, I think Bryce is the the better player. He's older, he's got better physical tools. Juju's a little bit more advanced, but uh, Bryce is the better player, in my opinion. They're both very good, but Bryce is definitely the better player to me. Uh, Gideon Rosa, I hate to discuss this, but does Zach, Zachariah Branch have a chance to beat Worthy's 40 time when he comes out? I have no idea. I have no idea what, what kind of explosiveness, what kind of just full pure speed Zachariah Branch has. He's very fast, but is he is he more quick than fast? As far as like, you know, he's a 4-4, but he's just so quick and shifty, he looks faster. Is he a legit 4-2? I know he was in – I think he was a guy that was um, – I think he won one of the fastest man competitions at a thing that Dylan Edwards was in. I think Dylan – or Dylan beat him. Uh, and one of them, I think, is – you know, they they were in the finals. He's fast. He's very, very fast. Will he beat a 4 2 one? I have no idea. I, I'd be a little surprised if he did. But, you know, guys are getting faster and faster and faster. So it's certainly possible. But I, I would say this. I think Zechariah Branch – has a chance to be a much better receiver than than Xavier Worthy, in my opinion. Who has better physical tools, Jane Daniels or Deuce Knight? It seems to me that Deuce fits into Denbrock's offense beautifully. Definitely Deuce Knight. I mean, let's not forget, Jane Daniels, who had a very, very good year this year, guy that from week five on, I'm like, that's my Heisman Trophy guy. That's my pick. This was his fifth year as a starting quarterback. Not fifth year of college, fifth year as a starting quarterback. He benefited greatly from experience. He's got good talent, but I, I like when I'm seeing people project him to number three pick in the draft. I, I don't see that. I, I just I don't see the arm. I don't see the body. Great athlete, but that doesn't fly as much in the NFL unless you're a Lamar Jackson type. And I don't know that he's that kind of athlete. I don't put him in the Michael Vick, Lamar Jackson. He he processes relative, I mean, well for a fifth year senior. But he's not elite at it. He's got a good arm, but not a great arm. Deuce has a cannon for an arm. Deuce is is every bit as athletic, if not more so, than Jaden. And Deuce is also going to be a lot bigger than Jaden was. So uh, physical tools, yes. Jaden was more advanced as a quarterback at the same age, coming out of high school, than Deuce is. Now, in fairness to Jaden, too, I often wonder what kind of career would he had if he'd have gone somewhere other than Arizona State, I think that stunted his growth a little bit. I think if he would have gone to play for Lincoln Riley or, you know, a, a better quarterback developer, I think Jaden's career would have looked a lot different. But he didn't. That's not the path that that he went down. Ronnie Reeves with another question: Do you think we see Jalen Seed fulfill his talent level and be a big time player? Does he get passed by some of the younger talent? I honestly don't know, Ronnie. This is going to be a big spring for Jalen. I think we're going to start to see the answer to that this spring. That's what I can tell you. Will he do it? I don't know. I I, I don't know if Jaden has the work ethic to be that guy. I don't know what his mental acumen is. I don't know any of those things because we just haven't seen him. 
if he has those things, great, and, and he can tap into it. But I, look, he could fulfill his talent level and still get passed up by other players. And I had him as a top 50 recruit coming out of high school. It's also where I had Jay Osbury ranked. I had Drake Bowen ranked as a top 100 guy, but Drake Bowen has the highest ceiling of those three, in my opinion, because Jalen can run, but Jalen's 6'1", 215. Drake is 6'3", 240, 235. You know, Jaden Osbury's 6'1", 230, 225, 230 when it's all said and done. So I don't think he has the highest ceiling of all the guys on the on the roster at linebacker. So I know some people think he did because he was a five-star recruit, but I, I didn't grade him as a five-star recruit. He's very, very talented. This isn't at all to take away from Jalen. It just means, yes, he could be that good and still get passed up. But most likely if they all pan out, they're all going to play. And, and Jalen can have an impact role. My question for Jalen is, is he a rover? Is he a will? Is he going to do both? What kind of role is he going to have on third down? Those are all very fair questions. And honestly, I don't know the answer to that. But if he doesn't show it, to your point, Ronnie, if he doesn't show it this spring, he's a junior now. I don't know that it's going to pop all of a sudden. Because Asmar Bilal was able to kind of figure it out as a fifth-year senior because the depth at the position wasn't great. If you if Jalen Steed doesn't figure it out till he's a fifth-year senior, he will have already been passed up by a, a lot of guys, not just Jaden and – and Drake and Kingston, but also Preston Zinter potentially, Bodie Cahoon potentially. I mean, there's some, and who knows who they get in the 2025 class. So he's going to have to start to figure it out pretty quickly, in my opinion. David Jones asked the question, with the safety depth chart being thin, is it the, is the ideal time to give Clarence Lewis a chance to say, David, it's been the ideal chance to give Clarence Lewis a shot at safety for three years. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's another ideal chance to give him a shot at safety. I do think, and I've said this before, I think this is the year we actually see some of that. And I think what they're going to do, because of the numbers that you talked about, David, because of the numbers, it would make sense this spring to cross-train him. Because I, I don't think they're going to move him to safety right now. I don't think they're going to – like I think they're going to have him kind of play nickel outside and some safety and just get some looks at safety this spring and see how he can do and see if he's comfortable there. Cause like there's the scenario where we've been begging for this to happen. He may get back there and just not see the game well from safety. That, that, that can happen. It's a different game. It's just completely different. eye discipline. You're looking at completely different things, you know, outside in there's, there's never really anything outside of you, you know? So, so, so long as this guy doesn't run outside of me, I'm good. Whereas the safety, you may be looking in here and there's two guys running outside of you. It's a different game. I, it, most guys can do it, but not everybody. So we'll see. It just may not be comfortable for him to go back there. Maybe it does. We'll find out. But I think I think we'll at least see him get some reps of safety this spring, in my opinion. Irish Blooded, what expectations do you have for Bubakar Traore this year? Or do you think he is still a year away from making a difference? Well, I hope not. I, I think this is the year where we start to see him play more. Does that mean he's going to be make a difference at times? I mean, he's already kind of done that. He had a big sack against USC last year. He didn't play a whole lot outside of that. I'd be surprised if he's not playing. I think he'll at the very least take Josh Burnham's or Junior Tulamaka's snaps at Viper. Here's what I mean by that. I think with Josh Burnham moving to big end, I think Junior takes Josh's reps there. And Josh Junior was kind of the third Viper this year. I think Bubakar takes a lot of those reps as the third Viper, at very least. So we'll see him play. I think we'll see him play in some third down situations as a pass rusher. I think he'll get some opportunities to do that and uh, is, is going to make an impact. Will he make a difference? We'll see. But I, I, I would be, I don't, I'm not, look, a year away for me is partially true from being the guy. I think he's probably a year away from emerging as the guy, a Viper. It could happen this spring. It really could. But I'm more projecting this year he kind of does what Foskey did, right? Because that's the path that Isaiah Foskey took at Notre Dame. I think I think Bubakar reminds me a lot of Foskey, actually, in that regard. That very raw guy coming out of high school. Bo uh, Isaiah played a little bit more as a true freshman. Because if you remember, uh, you know, that was that was when the the rule was in place for you got guys could play four games in redshirt. So I believe Foskey played four games as a freshman. Yes, he played in four games as a freshman. 
had five tackles uh, that season in 2019. Then 2020, he was a key backup, you know, made 20 tackles, had five tackles for loss, four and a half sacks, had a pass breakup, blocked a punt against Pitt, if you remember. Uh, I think he blocked it and returned it and recovered in the end zone. And then it was his junior year that he really broke out. I could see something similar for Bubakar this year. You know, four or five tackles for loss as a backup, most of them sacks as sort of a rotation, you know, get in there, get some pressure, be part of the third down package. And then next year, whoo, light goes off and he explodes. I could see that. But it wouldn't shock me if we see that at some point in time this season. I'm just not expecting it. I just want to see him be part of the rotation. That's what I want to see from Bubakar. Earn that rotation spot this year and then build on that and become that dude next year is 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 a more reasonable expectation for Bubakar. But, of course, some guys expedite that process. Brandon Plesner asks, is Bo Collins going to be here for the spring practice? He, he'll probably be at some spring practices as a spectator, but he will not be participating in the spring. He's still at Clemson for the semester, finishing up his degree. So that's that's where he is. Baby Huey, could Jerome Bettis Jr. be a preferred walk-on if Notre Dame wants to take more receivers? I would guess his family could afford the education. We've been asked this several times. No, he's not going to be a preferred walk-on. Why would you turn down a scholarship offer from Georgia Tech or Texas A&M or any of the other schools that are recruiting him as a, as a preferred walk-on or as a scholarship player to be a preferred walk-on at Notre Dame? Because the thing is, if you don't value me enough to be a scholarship player, then I'm not going to really have a chance to compete there. And I don't think it's fair that just because he comes from money that you say, well, okay, well, then, you know, we're going to ask you to walk on because your parents can afford it. If he's earned the right to be a scholarship player at your school, then be a scholarship player. I personally am not very high on Jerome Bettis Jr.'s game, but if the Notre Dame staff wants him, they're going to need to offer him a scholarship because he's not a kid that's like getting offered by like his next biggest offers like, Boston College or or Purdue. His next, I mean, he's got an A and M offer. He's got a Georgia Tech offer. He's got some good offers in schools that like him. And so, if I were him, I a big thing for him is: Do you really believe I can play, or are you just recruiting me because of who my dad is? And if Notre Dame was going to do that, then that would tell them, okay, you're not really, you're not really a guy that we like. And so we're going to move on. Or, you know, I, we're going to move on and go to another school. He's a scholarship guy. And look, he's going to be in the class soon, much sooner rather than later. That's the one thing from the Intel piece that I'm going to give you. And it'll be as a kid that's going to get a scholarship. That's just, that's just where we're at. Agree with it or not. I completely fair, baby Huey, but that's where we're at. Got a question from Peter. This is a, a, a good one. Who do you think will lead the team in receiving yards? And will we finally have a thousand yard receiver? Again, it's like with the Riley Leonard with a thousand yards rushing, which you asked. It's possible. I could see maybe Chris Mitchell breaking out like that. I could see maybe, you know, Jaden Greathouse has that breakout season. You know, maybe, you know, a Bo Collins can have that kind of year. But I think the fact that I can name you, maybe Jaden Thomas is their best receiver. Maybe it's Bo Collins. Maybe it's Deion Colsey. Maybe it's Chris Mitchell. Maybe it's Jaden Greathouse. Maybe it's Jordan Faison, and oh, by the way, Mitchell Evans is really good, and Eli Raritan might be your best pound-for-pound pound athlete amongst your skill positions. The fact that all those things are true and you're going to be getting the ball to Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price in the past game is why I don't think anyone's going to rush for a 1,000 or have a 1,000 yards receiving. I think the ball is just going to be spread around way too much. And when I say that, keep in mind, I'm talking about like in a 12-13 to 13 game series. Now, if Notre Dame plays 15, 16 games and plays for the championship, then sure, a guy might get to a 1,000 yards, at that point in time, because a thousand yards in 16 games, you've only got to average 62 and a half yards a game, you know? So it's a little different than when you're talking about 13, where you've got to average 77 yards a game, basically get to a thousand yards. So certainly, certainly possible if they play more games, but just a normal 12 to 13 game season. I don't, I don't think so, anybody will, but it wouldn't shock me if like one guy steps up and is that guy. I mean, Chris Mitchell's already had a thousand yard season. At, in college and his second or third highest game that he had was against an, an sec team i just think the ball is going to get spread around too much usma 87 thoughts on the three signing periods discussed in the NCAA meeting recently the cfb nation guys had a good discussion on this they had a very good discussion on this to me 
there needs to be two. I don't know what the point of the December 4th one is other than, or the early December one is other than let's get guys committed it get their signature on a piece of paper before the coaching moves happens. That's what it's about to me. Uh, you you want to get guys signed before this coach leaves for this job, that coach leaves for that job. If the December period is too much for coaches, and I believe that it is, I don't believe there should be a December signing period. It needs to then get rid of it entirely. They should not have to be worried about getting guys to sign the week after the conference championship games either. I mean, that's that's a lot as well. There should be one in late June or July and one in February, and that's it. And And so I don't think there should be three. Having said that, I would much rather there be three with one over the summer and still have them moved up December 1 because what will most likely happen is a lot of kids just will choose not to sign in that early. They'll either sign in the summer or a lot of them will will then say, hey, I'm going to wait till December to let all this coaching movement happen is what you're going to start seeing more and more of, in my opinion. There'll still be some in December. Like December won't become like non-existent like like February, you'll see kids that want to sign and they didn't commit till the season or whatever. They'll they'll get into there, but you're you're going to see more guys signing in the summer and then more guys waiting until February to, to let things play out. That's what I think will end up happening in that one. Archer four five two five star Ohio safety. No, he's not a five star. I don't care who ranks him as a five star. Trey McNutt's a good football player. He's not a five star. Uh, but Trey McNutt has been suspended one game by the Ohio High School Athletic Association for competing in a national 707. Why do some states have the dumbest athletic rules? Because there's just dumb people that just want to control every aspect of these kids' lives. I think that's an ignorant rule. I hope that Trey McNutt, who has, uh, I think, a family that could probably back him a little bit in that one, but I hope he fights it. I do, and I hope that it leads to that rule being changed. There's no reason for that. Like, Here's the thing. Ohio doesn't even really allow them to do anything for football over the summer. So so why not let them do it? Like, it'd be one thing if it's like, hey, listen, we have a spring seven-on-seven seven league with your high school team, and you don't want guys coming away from your high school teams to go do this. Fine. Okay, I understand that. But there's no reason for this rule. It's just, um, it's just a, a, a ridiculous rule that it's not even archaic. It should have never been that way, in my opinion. Should Should never have been that. That should never have been the rule. In my opinion, Gideon Rosa, do you think guy? Do you think EA twenty five will have ninety any ninety nine overalls? I would have to think uh, Caleb Downs would be in the conversation, but I can't think of anybody else. Oh sure, yeah, there'll, there'll be some there'll be some guys that'll be um, that'll be ranked that'll be ninety nines. I mean, not a ton. I don't remember there being a ton to be completely honest with you. But yeah, there'll be some guys that'll that'll be ranked ninety nines. I would imagine coming back. I mean. I could see some ridiculousness like Travis Hunter being there, which I don't think he should, but I could see something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think there'll be some. Not a ton, but yeah, there'll be some. Maybe Quinn Ewers, perhaps. We'll see. I just realized that I didn't answer part of Peter's question. He says, who do you think will lead the team in receiving yards? And then the 1,000-yard question. So I did address the 1,000-yard question, but I didn't get to the other one. Honestly, Peter, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm back and forth. I, I know I've given the answer to Chris Mitchell. I've given that answer before. I've given Jaden Thomas before. I've given uh, Jaden Greathouse before. I could see Bo Collins or Deion Colsey being that guy. I honestly don't know. I really, I, and, and I could see Mitchell Evans having a huge year and getting 800 yards and leading the team because the receiver yards are so spread out. I could see all those. I really don't know yet. I'll, ask me again after the spring. I have a much better sense of it then. All right, Robert Bishop asks, your thoughts on Riley Leonard being left out of ESPN's top 10 quarterbacks list for 2024? I could care less personally. Well, you care enough to ask me about it, Robert. So you obviously care a little bit. Um, I, I kid with you, Robert. I I, I do not care. It's, uh, I mean, I, it's hard for me to, con- let me just, give me a second to pull this list up because I don't know the context of it. It could be, it could be some kind of context that would explain why he's not in it. I, I honestly don't I ranking the top 10 quarterbacks in 2024. You got Carson Beck, Dylan Gabriel, Quinn Ewers, Jalen Milrow, Noah Fafita. Um, I, that's just kind of silly. You've got him. You've got Jackson Dart. You've got Jalen Daniels. 
You've got Shador Sanders, Cameron Rising, and Cameron Ward. I mean, the, also receiving votes. Riley Leonard wasn't even the next guy receiving votes. I think that's kind of ridiculous, but he's been at Duke. I mean, that, that's the reality of it, guys. I mean, Cameron Rising's way overhyped. I'm not surprised he's in there, although I wouldn't have him in there. I don't see how you could have Jalen Daniels in there if if you're not going to have Riley Leonard because Jalen Daniels has, has been really dynamic when he plays, but he's been a guy that's gotten hurt a lot. I mean, he's never passed for more than 2,014 yards. He's never rushed for more than 419 yards. He has 13 career rushing yards in in, in Kansas, and Riley Leonard had 13 in one year at Duke. So there's really no Noah Fafita this past year. Great season. I mean, you know, really talented freshman quarterback. Threw for 2,869 yards and 25 touchdowns, and I think he had minus rushing. Actually, he was a, a second year player, actually redshirt freshman. So his years, his second year stats. In college, he rushed for 2,000. He rushed for or passed for 2,896, 69 yards, 25 touchdowns, six picks. So fewer yards than Riley Leonard, more touchdown passes, same amount of interceptions. He rushed for minus 33 yards and no touchdowns. So Riley Leonard had eight more touchdowns. So it's absurd, but it's also not surprising, guys. I mean, when are we going to stop being surprised that ESPN has something negative, has a bad, just a bad take, period? It's not even just about Notre Dame. It's just bad takes, period. So, I mean, how are you going to have Jalen Daniels ahead of Cameron Rising and Cameron Ward? I mean, at least they know that they can finish the season. So, I mean, just overall bad take, but I, I don't know why we're surprised that ESPN has bad takes and that part of their bad take impacts Notre Dame. It's just, it's kind of par for the course. Tom Frawley, coach, do you see Denbrock developing dual threat quarterbacks from the start? What's his philosophy with the QB room? Well, I mean, that's been his MO, right? I mean, he's always been someone that believes in having mobile quarterbacks. We saw this at Notre Dame. You know, what you think about who they recruited when he was kind of the OC, you know, Deshaun Kaiser, you talk about Ian Book to a degree, they had Malik Zaire, Brandon Wimbush. I mean, they were all about mobile quarterbacks. He was rec- he was the guy that was the driving factor in them making Phil Dracovic a priority before he got let go after 2016. Because remember, Phil was already committed to Notre Dame uh, at that point in time. So Phil was committed when Chip Long got hired. And so he was committed for a long time to Notre Dame. And so he has always been a guy that's liked mobile quarterbacks, Desmond Ritter at Cincinnati, Jaden Daniels at, at LSU. They got Ricky Collins, his first class. Uh, they were recruiting Bryce Underwood at quarterback uh, in in tw- the 25 class. Ended up getting him, I believe, after Coach Denbrock left or shortly, I think, after he left, uh, they got him. But I mean, he's always recruited mobile quarterbacks. That's just been kind of his thing. Now, he, I think the degree to which you have to be a mobile quarterback can vary. You know, Mike Denbrock's going to love a guy like C.J. Carr, even though C.J.'s not a runner, but C.J. can certainly do some things uh, as a as a as a quarterback that you can fit into what he likes to do as a as a uh, they got Colin Hurley last year another not quite as mobile as some of those other guys but but a, a good athlete as well so that's kind of always been his mo has been dual threat quarterbacks so yeah I think he'll and, and another reason I think he'll do it from the start is because his starting quarterback will be a dual threat quarterback in Riley Leonard so I think that's the other reason for it as well. Riker Ferg, who would be the most scared to trash talk to their face? MJ, Kobe, Larry Bird, or Magic? Um, I mean, I would not be afraid of talking trash. I would be afraid of talking trash to all of them right now as me because they would all destroy me in basketball, obviously. But if I was a really good basketball player, it'd be it'd be anybody meant Magic. I mean, it's just because – talk about scared to talk trash because you just know you're going to just – you're going to tick them off and, and they don't respond well to you talking trash because it's just like – I heard was a story um, Dominic Wilkins tells us all the time. It's that great game seven, or it was a game six. As game seven of the 88, I think, Eastern Conference Finals, 87 or 88 Eastern Conference, Eastern Conference Finals with the Hawks or semifinals with the Hawks. Dominic was having a great game. Hawks were winning. It was a close game. And Dominic tells a story that at, like coming in that fourth quarter, Bird had like 12 points or something like that. And Kevin Willis started talking trash to Bird. And Dominique was like, dude, shut up. Like, don't wake up. Don't wake him up. Don't don't get him, you know, let him sleep. And so Bird just goes out and just has this monster fourth quarter, one of the greatest dual threat, dual bat, dual, you know, duels that you, you'll see in the playoffs in, in between him and Dominique in the fourth quarter of that game. It's like, yeah, you don't want to sleep on him. There's a story about 
Um, so it was Kevin Garnett talking trash to Michael Jordan when he was with the T-Wolves. And J.R. Ryder was like, dude, shut up because I've got to guard him. And then Jordan just goes off. Kobe was that way as well. So it, Magic to me is just – Magic would kind of have that same feeling, but Magic is just – he'd be kind of fun to kind of talk a little trash to, if I'm going to be honest with you. Florida Irishman asks, who do you see getting the most snaps at running back in short yardage situations? As of right now, I'm going to go Jabron Payne. That would probably be mine. Um, yeah, that that probably be my pick, Jabron Payne. I think he's a guy that uh, just looking at the team last year, short yardage, I mean, that was kind of already his role. Kedron would have to beat him out in order to get there. Could Kedron do that? Sure. Sure. I could see him doing that, but I, I don't think he will. You also had a question from a Florida Irishman. Says, any chance Benjamin Morrison gets snaps at nickel? against teams that can match up better. Example would be USC. It's possible, but that's not really the philosophy that Al Golden has. Al Golden's philosophy is he's going to master playing here. He's going to be really good there, and, and we're going to just lock up that. Um, th those are things that, that we're going to that, – that, um, uh, I, I think you're just going to care more about that. And then the nickel, you can play to the nickel. And if a team has a really good – if a team has a really good like a, a slot that can kind of hurt your nickel, then you do things to affect that coverage wise, as opposed to moving Benjamin Morrison. I think that's going to be the big thing. Tom Frawley, hey, I just got your email, buddy, and I'm glad you're doing better, and we're glad to have you back. Um, yeah, definitely glad to, that you're doing better, and we're happy to have you. And, and you don't need to apologize for missing time with us, man. We uh, we appreciate you, and, and we're glad you're you're back to feeling good about it. So uh, I really, I really. Thank you for sharing that with me and letting me know what's going on. So, folks, that's going to do it. We are out of questions. And so, yeah, we're going to we're gonna wrap things up here today. We will have an IB Nation sports talk tonight, tonight at 6 o'clock. I'll be back tomorrow with a show uh, previewing sh different aspects of, of spring. Do the same thing Wednesday, same thing. Uh, though Thursday, uh, showtime will be a little bit later. And we're going to look back and uh, – uh, the practice. So we're going to have a practice on Thursday. We're going to be at full practice. So the, the the Thursday show will be a recap of practice. And then Friday, we'll be back with Notre Dame recruiting hour. So definitely check those out. Guys, if you haven't done so, do me a favor. Hit that, Sign up for the message boards. We got, we've got we dropped a huge intel piece today on the board. Ryan and I have been spending the last couple of weeks getting as much intel as we can. Uh, we put all that together. I wrote it up, but it was intel from both of us, just stuff that we've gathered from all of our sources and so we got that, but you can get that at boards at ourbreakdown.com. Folks in the chat will tell you the ones that have ran off and looked at that before the show started. I think there's a lot of really good intel in there, just kind of really going through the whole thing. Uh, just the whole here's it where everything stands. There's all the intel we got on the whole stuff of where we are. So you definitely want to check that out. And uh about finished with some of my breakdowns. So we're gonna start having more stuff on that today. I actually was gonna put one of the breakdowns up this weekend, but the message board for some reason is not letting me put a video up. So we're getting that fixed. And once that's up, I'm going to have some breakdowns of the Mike Denbrock offense and just what we can expect and all that, but that's going to be message board only stuff. So you're definitely going to check that out. So for, uh, for the rest of my crew at Irish breakdown, I want to thank you all so much for being with us today and thank you for your support. Hit the like button on your way up, hit the subscribe button. If you have not already done so hit the notification bell, share this podcast, give us a five-star review, but more importantly, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day, and we'll talk to you again on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.